nostalgia rages across the land, where everyone and their mother has a podcast, where there's still a movie trailer guy who says, in a world, three friends revisit films, shows, and games that molded them as they search for answers to life, the universe, and everything in between. Settle in and join us for Screen Refresh. Welcome back to Screen Refresh, a show where we revisit the films, shows, and games from our childhood, try to take another look at what we fell in love with. As always, I'm Tim, and I'm joined by the rest of the Screen Refresh crew, Nick and Dean. Hello there. My name is Dean. <laughs> you said that right. As you chamber one round onto the ground. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's the spooky season, which um, is kind of my place of power. I look forward to every year. So naturally, when my pick power, rolled around... Be. Wait, what? It's a place of power. Gotta be. It's a <laughs> Witcher thing. Sorry. Place of power. It's gotta be. Never heard of it. So when my pick came up for October, naturally, I have to go with one of the, the horror movies that I grew up on, which was Frank Decker's The Monster Squad. This was a, a movie that we had taped off VHS. Well, we didn't. We taped it on VHS off TV. I think it was like a TNT or Channel Twenty. I think that was like a UPN or something. All I know is I to this day I probably remember all the commercials, and I remember it was around the time that uh, Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous was still a show because I remember seeing commercials for new episodes in between this. Champagne wishes and caviar dreams. I'm Robin Leach with those champagne wishes and caviar dreams. <laughs> So do you like picture the commercials? They're just they're part of the movie. Like they're there's a we're gonna there's talk a couple about times in my notes where I just say commercial break because <laughs> I still remember like when they would do the the fade out and then I remember some of the commercials and then I remember it coming back. But I remember I think honestly on the same VHS we had this taped and I think it was followed by Rockadoodle if I recall correctly. So for some reason in my head I just had both of those movies tied together as some sort of weird double feature at all times. Reminds me of old mixtapes, like where you hear a certain song and then you're expecting another one to start because you, I'd made like all these mix CDs back when burning yeah. CDs from MP3s was cool. And it's weird when you don't hear the song you're expecting because of just hearing that one CD for ages. I feel like, so sidebar, mixtapes, mix CDs, play, it's a lost art. I don't know if it's quite as effective on like doing it via Spotify these days, but I feel like there was just something cool about finding all of these songs you want to show your friends and then putting them all and burning them to a disc. And then we'd be like shooting pool up in my attic and just put that disc on and just look around the room to see like you guys picking this up. My, uh, I was thinking I was well known among my football team because I would, I would burn what I call Dean's greatest hits. And just like I had like Was seventeen just or jams? like twenty volumes, Dean's oh. chop champs. <laughs> well, it was just y'all ready for this on yeah. repeat. There we go. <laughs> I I would be very interested to someday see or hear your your mix CDs. I think I still have them in a some sort of case back home in uh, in Connecticut. So I mean, because of the era, you know, corn, Limp Bizkit, Slipknot. All the disturbed. <laughs> okay, so ours were titles. probably interchangeable. <laughs> <laughs> so Monster Squad. So speaking of rock and soundtracks, the Monster Squad theme, the uh, montage song, always got stuck in my head from this. And I'm just, we'll get to it at the end. But I, I'm just glad this keeps up the '80s, or late '80s, early '90s tradition of a awkward rap song to end the the film over the credits. So for anybody unfamiliar, The Monster Squad was August 17th, 1987. It brought in $3,769,990, which seems, I guess, like a lot until you consider that it got beat out by, I believe, Disorderly No Way Out. by a good $7 million. Wait, how much did it make? Disorderly's made $10 million. Yeah. How much did this one make? Uh, 3.7. Yeah, I know it had a really disappointing... It bombed, essentially. It was a bomb. I mean, I don't think a lot of Shane Black's movies ever really 
they were like cult things. They were fun, but I don't think any of them were just like did gangbusters at the box office. I mean, Lethal Weapon. True. Actually, yeah, I take it back. Lethal Weapon. But I mean, other than that, we're talking like Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, uh, Last Boy Scout, The Nice Guys. I mean, granted, well, Iron are, Man 3, but that's just by nature of Marvel. Those are all adult movies, though. With this being led by the kid, it's the horror version of the Goonies. This yes. was very crude at times. <laughs> Rude? <laughs> to put it lightly. Yeah, it has some non-PC <laughs> elements. Today it would not be considered PC. Well, well a lot of those. That. So when you mentioned that you watched the TV edit this whole time, like... That makes sense because I don't think they would have aired it uncensored on TV. Which I'm actually surprised that as a kid and then watching this now, I don't remember anything popping up in this version now that I yeah. didn't remember as a kid. If you took out nearly half of the insults, more than half of the insults that they <laughs> had in that movie, I think it would have been a lot more bearable. But five minutes in, these kids were obnoxious and completely rude. I think <laughs> Ben from fucking Short Circuit would have taken notes from these kids. <laughs> That's how bad they were. I didn't think it was that bad. Like, generally. It was pretty bad. A lot of I a mean, lot of words and insults that we definitely don't use nowadays. No. It certainly falls into the... Mainly just the bully. That... No, the kids... Don't. Well, no. Across the board. Um, it definitely falls into that kind of 80s casual homophobia and whatnot of uh, some of the things that they even say between each other or not all of it ages well. And we we can't change it. So, yeah, you just just cringe at the F word and move along. The rest of it, I'm just like, Pretty yeah, there was only we'll get to it. But there's only really one part of the movie that I'm like, was that is that was that considered OK? But uh, yeah, we'll get to it. So. Yeah, as Nick mentioned, it opened against The Disorderlies, the, the movie with the fat boys. It opened against Can't Buy Me Love and No Way Out, the Kevin Costner neo-noir that, I guess, uh, beat The weekend overall, before being followed up later that month by The Garbage Pail Kids, and then <laughs> all of them got eclipsed by Dirty Dancing that just shellacked everything else that month. No one put the baby in the corner. Oh, no. Everyone put Monster Squad in the corner. <laughs> they did. Unfortunately. So yeah, so as we mentioned at the top of the show, this is a it was directed by Frank Decker, who also did some of the writing with Shane Black on this one. Frank Decker, he ended up doing um like Robocop three. He did House with William Cat, um, which is another fun kind of horror comedy if you've never seen it. Night of the Creeps, yet another fun kind of horror comedy, um, with Tom Atkins. So check that one out as well. But then Shane Black, naturally, everybody knows him. Kiss, Kiss, Bang, Bang, Predator, Nice Guys, Last Boy Scout. We've mentioned all of those. Iron Man 3. So not to get... Iron Man 3, yeah, that one too. So not <laughs> to get too far into kind of the, the casting, but Sean, the main kid, was Andre Gower, who for years I thought was Andre Brower until I watched Brooklyn Nine-Nine <laughs> and it was like, oh, this is going to be great. The kid from uh, Monster Squad plays the police chief. And then... He, <laughs> Andre Brower comes out. And I'm like, I think I might have these two mixed up <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> yeah. And now looking back now, it's like, oh, yeah, I absolutely love Andre Brower. Um, but now I, I realize how incorrect I was. So we have the Stephen Mocked as the father Dell, which for some reason, I always felt like they could have slotted in Roy Scheider and he would have done the exact same job here. They have that same kind of like looking feel kind of look too. Yeah, it's Probably kind of like wanted the, him, but he was too expensive. Yeah, <laughs> it's like that kind of grizzled. You can just look at him and be like, "Yeah, grizzled police chief." I wouldn't replace him anyway, though. He did a good job. Oh yeah, he did a great job. I don't think any of the cast did a bad job in this movie. No. And then the the last one I just wanted to mention is Tom Noonan as Frankenstein's monster. That all the the monster work done in this movie, I feel, is very underrated overall. But especially Tom Noonan as Frankenstein's monster. We you know him from. Uh, he was the Ripper in Last Action Hero, the villain at the end. Uh, he was in uh, Ty West's House of the Devil. Just a, a very, seems like a very quiet man who just has a fun roles popping up here and there. So it's nice to see him in this. I think he brought a lot of good work to the Frankenstein's monster. The One of the lead effects guys played Gilman. I think he went on to play other monsters too in other movies mm -hmm. that he was working on. I can't recall. I, uh... Full disclosure, I watched 
there's a documentary called Wolfman's Got Nards. I watched it last night after I watched the movie. So I've got some super input. Any good? Saturday. Yeah, you should definitely check it out. Especially you. If you like the movie, it's it's great. I see it pop up. So yeah, I'll, I'll definitely have to check that one out. Because I'm uh, still a, a fan. Because I mean, growing up, I had to have seen this movie at least 200 times. Like this would be on wow. rotation. I watched it. Like, probably, I'd say, I don't know, four to five times a week. I don't think I realized up. when I... You probably told me, but when I saw uh, Andre Gower... Is it Gower? Where, <laughs> the lead kid. Gower, he's wearing yeah. um, Stephen King rules. I didn't know that's where... I didn't remember that's where that came from. I'm like, oh, that's where Tim got that shirt. Yeah, I had that Leo DiCaprio whistle thing whenever I saw it on screen. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny like so many people in that documentary the monster squad documentary like wear that shirt like it's just they wear it to the screenings no i can't <laughs> wear it now so sorry so the movie opens with kind of a a classic opening crawl a la well not a la star wars it's just a, an opening crawl it's not angled or anything but an interesting choice that they do the crawl completely silent so it's just like red text black screen telling us kind of the the background of everything that's going on and the battle with dracula and the forces of evil and all of that fun stuff from there which the as i said even though i I had fun with kind of the 80s soundtrack of the monster squad song the montage song the actual score like the actual music in the movie itself um great job as far as that like it's something that i remember growing up on and that still kind of clicks with me now yeah i mean i thought it was fine i guess i didn't notice any it it just serviced the movie i think in an appropriate it was just way music. yeah i guess to me i would just said it would just <laughs> serve it was just like you know, call up the studio's orchestra and have them play this shit, and it worked. I mean, it works. Yeah. You know. I'm not trying to be uh, negative about the movie, but I, I honestly didn't notice the soundtrack, which I guess could be a good thing, because sometimes if it's... <laughs> I mean, don't I, I, I'm being, like, genuine, because if it's not working, it's like the special effects thing, where, like, something as stupid as doing the shadows correctly, no one's going to notice it if you do it right. But the second you do it wrong people are going to pick up on it so likewise with this yeah. the soundtrack did suit the, the the whole score did suit the movie and i never noticed it but if it was out of place or something didn't seem right or a different cue was used in a spot where it shouldn't have been you would have picked up on it so i mean that is it, almost a backhanded compliment <laughs> but at the same time it was it, it it did its job yeah which i think makes sense as far as that because it's either it's sticking out because something's wrong or it's sticking out because it's the only interesting thing instead of the movie itself. <laughs> the Monster Co- Monster Squad So yeah, serviceable. <laughs> Let's put that on the vinyl. <laughs> we'll just have quote serviceable. I didn't Dean. notice it being bad, quote unquote. <laughs> so, yeah, we had the we see the a bat creature kind of transforming and drop from the ceiling, which I, I love the the hand effect of the wing kind of transforming into the hand. And then we're introduced to a, a transforming Dracula, which I feel Duncan uh, Reger, I believe his name, is kind of an underrated Dracula um, in terms of, I mean, yeah, we have like Bella Lugosi, we have Christopher Lee, we have all the other Dracula, but I feel his kind of gets lost in the shuffle, but he does a really good job as I far as this. I thought it was Matt Frewer for Just, a good 45 <laughs> minutes of the movie. <laughs> so, yeah, I think Dracula in other movies gets so romanticized that then to see him in this, where it's like, yeah, there's no romance to this Dracula. There's no, like, tortured soul. It's No, he, he's here to just suck people dry and Bring evil into the world via yeah. pure evil. Amulet. Can I talk about one trope here for a second? I don't know what's really a trope, but just something I no. notice. When he transforms, you know, it takes... They show it over the course of, what, 10 seconds or something? And I just... It's funny, like, in a lot of movies, when something transforms or changes for the first time, it's a very drawn-out process. And then, 
most other times when things transform, it's just they just do it. They just get right to it. It's like, have you seen the transformation? Now we're going right into it. <laughs> I can think of like the movie Transformers, like really. Well, actually, yeah. Like, when the first one, it takes like take ten seconds to transform, and then every you know every every other time it's instantaneous. <laughs> I, the, well, I, it's something I notice the movies in, do. It doesn't really regard, bother me. I guess it's just like they have to show it off. Like we'll we'll get to it later, but the scene on the plane where the like the floor drops out and then he like transforms into a bat and leaves this one we're watching like the hand expand and like move back into a human hand and then that one he's just kind of like yeah and bat form and then he just takes off you don't deserve this bat form that's all i just just i don't do it to impress you notice a lot i mean i think any movie that shows a transforming character kind of does that yeah so dracula's castle We are then traded to the villagers arriving with Van Helsing as they dynamite their way into the castle, which we will find that everyone, past and present, loves dynamite in this world. Yeah. It's just like non... It's like Acme dynamite. It's just like very (laughs) nondescript, brownish, grayish, reddish... Well, I guess I wouldn't imagine to be branded like Adidas dynamite. (laughs) (laughs) Van Helsing Dynamite. Only the best. Get the rainbow-colored dynamite. <laughs> they hop in. Uh, Van takes out a, a vampire bride, which seeing this kind of assault on the castle and seeing this fight and whatnot, if they ended up doing the entire movie during this time period, I think that also would have been cool. It would have been a very different movie, but also it would have been a very kind of a cool medieval horror kind of deal. Just because I feel like a lot of the medieval horror goes the route of like, I don't know. Once you go medieval, it becomes like religious horror because of all the like the crusades and things, or it ends up becoming like a gothic horror type scenario. I just want like a Army of Darkness style storming the castle classic uh, medieval horror. So it's uncharted you know. territory. You might as well write the script for it. I think the earliest and most abstract horror was that World War II movie came out a couple of years ago. It starts off looking like another Saving Private Ryan ripoff. Overlord. Yeah, and then it does a hard right left turn, whatever, to uh, some kind of genetic and experimental testing underground. And yeah, you saw it, right? Yeah, actually, I've been meaning to go back and rewatch Overlord just because I enjoyed it the first time I saw it. Because, as you said, like it's the the horror movie stowaway inside a World War Two like Saving Private Ryan movie. So it's. Definitely worth checking out at least once. I think it was produced by J.J. Abrams. Nope, I know you're a huge <laughs> fan. Forget I'll never watch it again. So, yeah, so they find this amulet after Van Helsing kind of ices one of the vampire brides. And he calls out his resident virgin to read the sacred text, which I love how Bring then kind of everything virgin. goes sideways. <laughs> Is that what he actually says? <laughs> In German, though. Ring he says, get the girl. He just says, get the girl, yeah. Rings a bell. I like how the entire place like goes sideways in terms of the... It starts like caving in. The floors are coming up. We have undead bursting out of the floors and attacking people. For something that I watched as a kid, it goes pretty <laughs> heavy into the the horror immediately in terms of you got vampire brides. You got people turning into bats and back into humans. You have undead bursting from the floor it's it sets it up very nicely in terms of kind of the the level of what you're going to be experiencing for the most part minus like kids jokes later you know the intro kind of set the tone weird for me too because i was expecting a different movie after the intro crawl because i really like more serious it you know it explains the whole what they're about to do and then at the very end they're trying to seal dracula away in the amulet portal and but they blew it. <laughs> yeah. My sister was once bitten by a moose. Um, <laughs> so that's Monty Python <laughs> opening credits. I was wondering, is are the dead, does the incantation bring the dead back to life? Is that what's going on? I'm actually unsure. I mean, it may be. I think it was close to the midnight where it was, you know, once midnight strikes, that's when evil will take over and all that shit. And I think oh, it was so getting kind close of coming to down that to the point. wire. Yeah. Oh, so because, yeah, that okay. makes sense. Because the only incantation was being said by Van Helsing's team, not by Dracula. 
he just needed to be around. The only thing I don't get is, is if they fucked up, what did Dracula do during the next hundred years? Well, just relax. But I don't. I, that's I, the, it, that's I was wondering, wondering why. The... Go ahead, Dean. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I was just confused as why Dracula's not there, and they open this portal. Did they just assume like he'll get sucked in somehow? Like, figure they should have waited till he was around before they open this up. I thought he overslept. <laughs> <laughs> and the, just see the bat going by oh shit oh shit oh shit and van helsing's translation or i hate how his name is scary german guy in the credits <laughs> but scary german guy's translation of van helsing's journal later on says that evil gets sucked into the vortex but everything is getting sucked into the vortex so is it not actually sucking up evil and it's just sucking everything up or is everything a little evil? Yeah, it's well, revealing something about these characters. Well, in terms of, I think, you know, on a scale of evil, I would imagine that Dracula would have been sucked up a little bit faster than Van Helsing. But... <laughs> well, like, the the force is dependent on how evil you are. <laughs> I know you ate my lunch, Jim, and he's just, like, gently getting tugged. <laughs> yeah, I can survive this. I want to know what happens in the void. Like, it's limbo. I want to know what's there. I'm wondering if it's like a like a, the Loki situation of they have that one realm of where everything just ends up. Probably. Yeah. When I think limbo, I think there's nothing. It's neither hell nor heaven. And you're just kind of in a void. Oh, it's just like the um, a Superman situation with the, oh, the negative the, zone or forbidden yeah. zone or whatever. Yeah. And there is no one to stop us! Sent him off to the Phantom Zone, didn't you? He left us no choice. <laughs> it's, we've killed Dracula, but freed Zod. <laughs> so, yeah, so a portal is opened and everybody gets sucked in. End scene. Present day. Did Dracula get sucked in? No, they, um, they don't show him. No. Yeah, was he even at that fight? No, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> like, I'm like, why did they open the amulet if he's not there to get sucked in? He Bond villained it? He was just like, take care of them. <laughs> I mean, in this case, it worked out for him. Yeah. Take the W. It took, a, it took his problems away. So, yeah, I wonder if that's the explanation of like, oh, and then the hundred years, that was the Dark Ages or something. Or maybe he just had other things to do. I mean, it would have been, what, 18, 1888 when Dracula was hanging out in Van Helsing. Oh, so, yeah, definitely not the Dark <laughs> Ages. It's when only a hundred years. Dracula Britain. We're waiting for our interns to verify that. <laughs> 1897. Huh. Good year. I thought it was older than that. It's three years away from being in the same century as the internet. So, present day, we have our heroes, Sean and Patrick, in the hot seat in the principal's office because they have been drawing pictures and not paying attention in science class, which I like how the principal is, like, showing the pictures, and he's like, well, what's this? And they're like, spider with human head. <laughs> Which I have to assume was Peter Parker's original superhero name until Stan was like, no, no, I have a different one. I like how he says it, the kid says it like a question, like he doesn't know what it is, it's just spider with human head? <laughs> like he's spitballing here? <laughs> like he's like, okay, okay, work with me. I'm giving you something, give me something back. <laughs> so, yeah, so we get introduced to spider with a human head. And I like how the principal is trying to, con like relate to them and he's like i get it i'm hip i'm cool <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> maybe i'm just a big kid because sean patrick i think science is cool yes science i dig it man oh <laughs> 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 listen you want to get chicks later in life you need money and you need the science degree we're eight <laughs> We just want to draw spiders with human heads, <laughs> which now would probably be very lucrative. So, again, like I know we mentioned at the top of the show, but unfortunately, like the movie falls prey to a lot of the movies from around this time in terms of kind of that, like the rampant <laughs> homophobia in terms of some of their jokes and conversations, as well as like a lot of weight jokes. I mean, Horace is their friend, and they even refer to Horace as fat kid for like 
fifty percent of this yeah, movie, and he's 90, part of their crew. Of the movie. Yeah, I can't remember them saying yeah. his name really. He said his name twice: once in the beginning against the bullies, and then at the very end of the movie when he's holding the shotgun against the bullies. No, this time yeah. he was protecting the bullies. Right. He was like, I mean, my he name. said it at them. Shh. I guess. Yeah. In yeah. the full cut, after he does that, he opens fire. Hey, fat kid. Good job. My name is Horace. <laughs> I'm just gonna say, oh, if he just blew them away. And then when, <laughs> then when the military shows up, he's like, I, I'm sorry, the Gill Man got them. And they're like, the Gill Man got them with 12 gauge buckshot. And he's like, yes. You should have seen him work the trigger with his flippers. The gill man bit them, and they were turning into gill men, so I had to just end it right then and there. <laughs> they, they they asked me. <laughs> they said, Horace, please. <laughs> they said, thank you, after I shot them. The werewolf <laughs> thanked the shooter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> True. Also, I like how they call him gill man and not creature from the Black Lagoon, which I have to assume is because... Creature from the Black Lagoon, if they're not from the Black Lagoon region, they're just like sparkling Gilman, Creature. so it doesn't count. <laughs> yeah. Well, they they got the blessing to use the monsters as inspiration, but Universal was like, do not, they have to be different. They cannot, you cannot try to recreate the classic look. You have to do your own spin, so. Which I think worked out well. Yeah, Gilman um, looks In terms awesome, of all the monster actually. designs. Oh, yeah. He looks incredible. And the Wolfman has a very unique look to him. It almost looks like the face itself is a little, I don't know, like feline-esque, which I guess supposedly they based the Wolfman face on Stan Winston. <laughs> mm. <laughs> I'd be flattered or... <laughs> I don't know. Citation character. needed there. It's IMDb <laughs> trivia. Is that what I look like? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I like how... They're arguing leaving the Sean and Patrick. They're leaving the principal's office. They run into the the teacher they refer to as Cathead. And I like how as they're walking away, a lot of harsh jokes from these kids. But I did laugh when he was like, I mean, a priest said I now pronounce you man and wife and it was okay with them. <laughs> yeah, that she's married. <laughs> yeah. And obviously with an earshot, too. Yeah, it, well, they were screaming it down the hallway and it made me laugh a couple <laughs> times throughout where I felt... They had no volume knob for their inner voice because they're sitting across a scary German guy and they're flat out insulting him to his face, but they're saying it amongst themselves like, hey, buddy, I can hear every word you're saying right now, (laughs) but in German. So as we mentioned before, Horace, the the kid outside having his candy bar, reading his book, the, the EJ, the brother from the Wonder Years, Ends up coming in to insult him and kind of uh, knock down his candy bar, beat him up, all of that fun stuff. Fun fact, EJ's buddy Derek is Adam Carl, who a couple years later would be the voice of Donatello in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2. Hmm. You don't say. So he's the the second bully. So Donatello got his start roughing up uh, high school kids. His backpack is purple, too. What a kawinky dink. (laughs) It all ties That's together. Got the role. Wait, he voiced Donatello. Isn't that like five years later in real life? Uh, so the, how old's this kid? Like 87. Then it would be 87. I think what? 92. Well, between yeah. 87 and 92 is five years. But I mean, how old is the kid? Because he looked young. At least so. six then. I don't know. So, so right that after means that he voiced him at like 18. I don't, are you sure? I don't know. I don't do any research. Don't do not do that, fucking <laughs> smartass. I know, I don't even have to look at your face, and I knew exactly which one you were making. I don't know, it just sounds odd, because the kid looked really young then, and like, all right, you know, puberty's a hell of a drug and all that, but knowing that he's going to be... Uh... Although, also, it may be a factor that Monster Squad released in 87, but if it got shot prior, then it could be a bigger gap between them. 87, so probably shot in 86 depending yeah he was a young man playing donnie which makes sense because they're teenagers so horace is getting pummeled by ej and then we get introduced to the coolest high schooler ever yeah as rudy rolls up on his bike with his sunglasses smoking his cigarette and despite being like the the rough and tumble cool kid he sticks up for horse which is nice like it's seems like he's not like prior friends with them they're not like oh we're all buddies 
Because after he helps out Horace there, Horace then like brings him into the group to be like, oh, hey, we should have him come hang out with us. So I guess it was just Rudy showing up and being like, yeah, I don't like this. And he just stopped it. So good on Rudy. Like, I know you don't, you can leave mysteries to some things, but what the fuck, Rudy? Like, where, who is this kid? Where did he come from? He's known, he obviously has power over the assholes of the school. Yeah. Because I have to, like, they show him later in the montage taking classes at the school. So it's like, okay, so it's not like he graduated and it's, (laughs) oh, he's the freshman at college driving back around. So it's like, no, he's just one of the other students that yeah. just is on a, a different yeah, level. Yeah, Rudy's 15 when they when they made this, the actor. So. Yeah. Yeah, he just got yep. those, and those like slides. He got those like Michael Jackson. He's shoes. the cool kid, right? <laughs> I felt he was the cousin of, hey, hey, um, where where did this movie take place fictionally? Fictionally, I, I don't know what town. I feel <laughs> he's like cousins with um, <laughs> Steve Harrington from Strange. Oh, Wars. I can 100% see that. Yes. And at the end of the movie, when she's like, oh, I did have sex with Steve, but it didn't count. My first thought was like, it was Harrington. Steve Harrington. <laughs> Actually, if they ended up doing like, I don't love the idea necessarily of a reboot because have fun with this movie. But if they did, I feel like just have, uh, what's his name? Um, Joe. Yes. I want to say Joe Perry. Joe sounds, Carey? Sounds about right. Whatever his name is. the Steve. Yeah. Have, have Steve be Rudy. Although at this point, Steve is probably like you can still pass, 27. I think. Well, again, Rob Schneider. It's one of those people that can pass. Like as, yeah. as, he gets a pass. As long as he needs to. <laughs> he just rolls up in an actual car. <laughs> Rudy. So, yeah. So we're introduced to Rudy. Who helps out Horace. He makes EJ eat the candy bar off the ground. Everybody laughs at him. And then they, they're on their merry way. So we're back to... Sean and Patrick kind of arguing as they're headed home, which I like how their argument is whether or not the wolf band can drive a car. And he's like, yeah, you can drive a car. I mean, <laughs> where's pants? It's like, I mean, not sound logic, but like, I, I don't see why he can't drive a car. I think it depends on how much he retains in a wolf form. But now all I want to see is a wolf man drive a car. Well, we're not in trouble unless he learns how to open doors. <laughs> Cut to door open, <laughs> werewolf. <laughs> I mean, how great an ending would that have been if they're all out in the town center and Dracula's like calling on the wolf man and the wolf man just like rolls a sedan over the top of um, like Dell. Rudy's out there fighting the brides and he just goes up and over a hood. I, <laughs> oh! I question the monster squad's credibility when a uh, specific scene later in the movie. Because I, I give the I give them the all right well the the whole werewolf thing with silver bullet how do you kill a vampire but walking into a protected room filled with crucifixes and garlic and it doesn't raise any red flags yeah if that if that werewolf wants to drive down the street I you know what power to him got to get to work <laughs> werewolf takes public transportation wolfman on the T I missed my stop. <laughs> Is this the green line? So, yeah, so they're arguing whether or not the Wolfman can drive a car. And I like how they're talking about Scary German Guy's house, which I hate how they never give him an actual name in this. He was the best character in the yeah. whole movie. And it was so depressing that he did that to him. Leonardo Samino, I think is his name, but in like in real life. So Scary German Guy's house, and they're talking about like, oh, World War II. And then Phoebe's like, no, we're at war with Vietnam. And they're like, how do you know that? And she's like, I saw Rambo. <laughs> it's just, yeah, I, I guess. Although I don't think in 87 we were still in war with Vietnam. No, it ended in <laughs> a little while ago. So this is when Horace shows up with Rudy and tries to convince the gang to let Rudy into the club, which they confirm uh, that they need to give him a monster test, which I think as a child being obsessed with horror movies that used to be something that I would walk around and have every, like I would ask everybody, I would be like, quiz me on monster movies when I was like seven. And I don't know if anybody cared or would just have enough knowledge off the top of their head to be like, here, let me give you a pop quiz. So it's, the internet was a really great thing for me as a child. In 95. In 95. So we get the delivery plane that has the crate in it, which we don't know what's in the crate just yet. 
but we have two pilots that are just like chatting back and forth. And I feel like this is the most Shane Black <laughs> that this uh, these characters can get as far as these of just like these two random guys just casually chatting back and forth. I'm depressed. What for? What do you mean, what for? I'm flying a World War II bomber with wooden crates in it and dead bodies. I should have a party. Do they complain? Do they get airsick? Do they ask for more of the little almond things? You're right. This is a great job. I'm really happy. <laughs> Got 100% agree with this guy. Like, it's... <laughs> nobody's out there complaining. It's literally the, the graveyard shift here. So... Until they start moving around. Yeah, and Clerks Randall did say the worst part about that whole job is the people, so... It's true. And now they're all dead. Until we hear a noise in the back of the, the plane. I thought they were dead. They are. I'm gonna, uh... I'm gonna check it out. Okay. Good. Right, you do that. I'll stay here and make spooky sounds. First of all, I love these two. Like, these guys are terrific. They seem fun. And I like how when the second pilot goes in the back to look to see what's going on, and we see Dracula standing behind him, which the guy doesn't notice him yet, and then Dracula waits for the guy to finally realize it and turn around and then sucker punches him. It's like, like bitch slaps him. Yeah. <laughs> like backhand. And just <laughs> front hand, backhand, and then it just like launches this guy across the room. Which I like how then the guy's response is pull the lever that just opens the cargo chute and just drops the crate. But then Dracula's just floating in midair. And this is what we were talking about, how it's the first time we're watching the hand and the wing and growing and whatnot. And then this, he just like does a smile and then whoop, bat. <laughs> Slide whistle. <laughs> <laughs> That's his transform bat. sound. <laughs> Just like a, a little piccolo thing. It's like... So I like how he... So he transforms into the bat and then he just takes off. Presumably because he needs to catch up with the crate so he doesn't lose it again. But I like how that means this guy gets to fight Dracula and live to tell the story. So both of these pilots, they lived in the end. You know what I just realized? Like, that was Dracula going to open the door anyway, like at that moment? Because he landed... Precisely where he needed to be. <laughs> a Dracula arrives precisely right. when he needs to. Yeah, there's some of the some of the writing just as far as the story is like I mean I'm not really I'm not complaining, but it's just funny. It's like, yeah, wait, why is this house here? Why is the game not here? Why are they flying what yeah. In any case. Yeah, because I mean, unless we're to assume that he bought that mansion specifically because the crate happened to land nearby. But no, because the amulet's in it. Late, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I don't know what his end game was here. Then Helsing like, moved to America, middle America. So um, yeah, I'm assuming then Dracula probably was expecting to go back there and then just drop the crate himself and then follow after it. And this guy just kind of like came in a second too soon. Dracula's head, he's like, this is perfect. <laughs> This is great. <laughs> Everything's um, coming up, Dracula. What's the address? 666 Shadow Brook Lane. Count me in. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not complaining. I mean, this movie this movie is great because it's just a, a series of classic lines and like great moments. But when you look at the, the overall plot, you're like, what the hell's going on? Like, why are they doing this? But it doesn't matter because it's cool. What if it didn't drop into the swamp and it was just like I-95? It was just like the highway? <laughs> just the great Frankenstein hits. gets wrecked just, by a semi. Yeah. <laughs> just lands in traffic and then plan. just gets destroyed. <laughs> I'm just picturing Dracula comes down in bat form and then still in bat form. You just see him just kind of like watch this whole thing just happen. Let it begin. <gasps> oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> he just continues flying and he just heads back. I cannot believe my luck. With all five, with all four of my monsters. So, <laughs> yeah, so the, the crate drops, Dracula follows after it, um, and we kind of get that from there. 
which then we get introduced to the Monster Squad Clubhouse, which I always envied at this clubhouse. Like, all of my friends... This who... is the epitome of, what, like, Treehouse. Yeah. This is exactly the what I always expected to have as a kid. I never had a Treehouse. I never had anything like it. But if I did, this is this would be it. I mean, it's, like, not multiple floors, but it's, like... You have a, a lower a section. Level. Yeah, it's a split level. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's got like, it's so cool. I, I really. It's funny just, how ramshackle it looks from the outside, but I'm like, this is a nice interior. Like, yeah, this is a great little place. I like how the Rudy goes from being the cool guy. And then once he gets in there, he immediately becomes the creepy voyeur. Now that he realizes that there's like a girl <laughs> next door. So. Sorry, Rudy. Come on, man. <laughs> so Phoebe tries to get into the clubhouse, which they kind of kick her back out there, which Phoebe is still somehow the the annoying little sister who even as a kid, when I watch this movie, I never thought of her character as annoying. It's like she still somehow is still likable, even though she's just like antagonizing them, trying to take part in all the stuff they're doing. Well, she don't take no shit. She gives it right back. Yeah, It's her fault she for does. wanting to be in the uh, He-Man Woman Haters Club. <laughs> She's sassy. They kick her out, and all of a sudden, it shows her outside, and she lights a dynamite stick. <laughs> Meeting adjourned. <laughs> so I had a brother. <laughs> so yeah, so Rudy says the only way to kill a werewolf, because they're doing the, the monster test on him, and he says the only way to kill a werewolf is a silver bullet, and the group says he's wrong, which, come on, guys. But one of them suggests that the other way to kill a werewolf is to throw them out of, or like throw them out of a f- window and then falling onto a bomb, which I never noticed well, until this viewing that I'm like, I mean, that really is what happens to him. They, yeah, I think it's a foreshadow. I think they probably added that maybe after the, or to the script after. But um, he says, yeah, he says silver bullet. And they're like, no, there's two ways. And he's like, oh, what's the other way? And they all look at each other like, uh. I think they just wanted to be smarter than Rudy. Um, (laughs) Yeah, they tried to like, yeah, and then none of them had a good idea. And then, yeah, they said, throw them out of a window onto a bomb. (laughs) Onto a bomb. (laughs) Although, I mean, technically, they put the bomb on him and then threw him out a window. So it's not the same. Maybe if they switched the order, it would have worked. Yeah. For being the gurus of monsters, they're losing their credibility, sir. Yeah. It's only one way to kill a werewolf. Just like, yeah, Horace says old age. <laughs> <laughs> what if they went around and it's everything you know, that actually happens to the werewolf in the movie? They're like, shoot him with normal bullets in a police station, kick him in the nards, throw him out a window, <laughs> hit him with a bat. <laughs> you you never see monsters dying. You know, you don't see them dying of old age. Like, you've never seen a werewolf die because he was uh, from complications. <laughs> you die a hero or live long enough to become the villain i guess die a villain or live long enough to see yourself become a hero that's what i wanted to see out of the wolf band yeah just turn sides at the end <laughs> i hate to jump around at the very end of the movie i really thought it was uncle rico not transformed shooting the gun at dracula as he's driving up for a quick second i thought it was him because clearly the man of the werewolf side did not like anything that he was doing. So I thought he was driving in trying to protect all the kids and stuff. I mean, that would have been great. Yeah. But then, you know, the camera refocuses and you see that it's just the dad cop getting out of the car. Which still kudos to I him wish it for was, but... that drive-by shot. But we'll get to that. <laughs> I mean, it shows that a werewolf can drive a car. <laughs> <laughs> it's in wolf form, driving a car, leaning out the window, firing at Dracula. <laughs> Shooting his gun. <laughs> Holy shit, he is so cool. <laughs> you promised me health care. <laughs> you said it had dental. So, yeah. So I like how they're doing this whole quiz with Rudy. And then Sean goes inside and his mother is like, oh, I was doing whatever it was and I got this journal for you while I was out which happens to be Van Helsing's actual journal. You know, just picked it up on the way out. Didn't know, didn't know what they had. Yeah. <laughs> what a find. It belongs in a museum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they have bottom men working on it. One child. So Sean's mom gives him the, the journal, which 
he's like excited about and he pops into it and then he realizes it is all in German and he can't read this. Abraham von Helsing, this is great! <laughs> this is German. So we jump around a bit because then the, the next thing we get Dracula at night overlooking the city and then to himself... He just says, Let it begin. And then there's the flash of lightning that then reveals his skull, which I still think was cool, but also weird choice. I thought he was talking about the Mortal Kombat tournament. <laughs> it has begun. <laughs> There's lightning at that moment, too. Lest you not mention, he somehow has acquired um, a hearse and it's got a, a cool uh, skull. Uh, ornament on the front of the car. Do you think that car is fresh? Was that in the plane too? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Was that in the plane that he just... Can you imagine him having on? to go to like the DMV and do like emissions testing and whatnot to get that car <laughs> registered? <laughs> I'm new in town. <laughs> We've got a lot of regulations here in nondescript state. And you're going to follow them. <laughs> Can I just buy the sticker? No. <laughs> so yeah Tries to hypnotize him i don't know why exactly it reveals his skull at first as a kid i thought the lightning struck him and this was like a cartoon effect of us seeing his skull <laughs> and in hindsight how Whoa. great would that have been for dracula to stand on that hill and be like let it begin and then just get struck by lightning <laughs> i hate it when that happens <laughs> So, yeah. So, this is when we're introduced to Dell, Sean's father, which I'd mentioned before, um, is played by Stephen Mock, who I said, like, has a very kind of Roy Scheider energy in this movie in terms of just kind of that, like, Sheriff Brody, grizzled, uh, tired captain here. So, I like how Sean's trying to convince him to let him go see this movie. Well, Dad, uh, some of the guys and me were maybe going to go see Groundhog Day Part 12 tonight. Only if it's okay with you. Is it, please? Oh, we got a problem. No way! Yes way. You gotta go out with your mother tonight. You got a certain five-year-old sister and these babies. Oh, come on, Dad. I'm waiting all year to see this movie. Is your pal? It's only a movie. Look, tomorrow night you and I will go see Groundhog Day. I'll get them early. <sighs> tomorrow night? That'll be too late. The guys will blab the entire plot. Plot? Did I hear plot? Sean, it is a guy with an axe. Anyway, I thought they killed him in the last one. They did. And he returns from his grave. He returns from the grave? Sean, he always returns from the grave. If they blew him up, put his head in a blender, and mailed the rest of the pieces to Norway, he would still return from the grave. That was part seven. And then Sean just says, what do you want? I want to see a stupid movie. And I feel like that has just been my mantra since I was a child seeing this. Is just, why do I want to see it? I don't know. I want to see a stupid movie. Okay, that's a fair excuse. Seeing any movie is fun. Yeah. Just movies. It's just, it's not life. You get a break. Do it. So we learned that they I think have... the dad also, I feel like he could have been in the Warriors. He could have been a warrior, I think. He kind of looks like Ajax, uh, James Remar, a little bit. Maybe that's why I'm thinking that. But I, I could, could see, see him in a Warriors leather jacket, like beating up <laughs> what if, baseball furies. <laughs> what if that's what he shows up in at the end of the movie? He rides in wearing the vest and nothing else, and he just fires at Dracula. On a motorcycle. <laughs> Dracula outside clinking bottles together. Yeah, so we get to learn that Sean's father, Dell and the mother, Emily, are having marital problems, most likely because of his work and everything like that. They Sean seems to be very aware of it, which Dell tells... Sean's mom that he has to go to work because a guy is saying he needs to be locked up. He's a werewolf. There's the the missing mummy, all of this fun stuff, which this is when we go to the police station. We get to see John Grease or Grise as the wolf man's human form, uh, which I always liked him in this. And it, it, because of this movie, whenever he would pop up in anything else, I would be like, oh, hey, it's him. It's the wolf man, which he sees the moon. He goes nuts, starts tearing apart this police station, steals a gun and just Desk pops it into the air before a deputy walks in and just shoots him, which I don't know if that's proper procedure, um, but sure. He was firing a gun. In the ear. He definitely would have been shot today if he did that at a police station. <laughs> I mean, probably before any of this happened. He would have been like, lock me yeah. up, I'm a werewolf. And they're the second like, he raised chances. his voice. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we, won't get into, we won't get into that. 
Yeah, so Dell and his He's running around shouting, have you seen my nephew Napoleon? <laughs> Wait, what? Oh. <laughs> you know, I've never seen Napoleon Dynamite, so every time you guys are mentioning Uncle Rico, oh. I'm like, I know the name. I hope it hasn't been ruined for you. You need to watch that. I'll I'll make an effort to watch that. It's very it's, offbeat. It's, it comedy. it holds up, in my opinion. Yeah. It's it's anyway. sad too, because you're like, I don't I don't know Uncle Rico. And I'm like, man, that's that's tough. It's like, oh, Sean Michael Bean, he's from Damn, I got uh He's he, Trevelyan in a 007. That's all I know him from. <laughs> yeah, instead of knowing him from other things. No, Michael Bean? Or Sean Bean. Sean, Sean Bean, Bean is Wait, the You said Sean Bean. You 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 wish I said Sean. But instead of thinking of like Kyle Reese from Terminator or like Hicks from Aliens, I'm trying to think of something else he was in. Exactly. <laughs> uh, that's that's the equivalent. I mean, what if the Wolfman shows up at the end of the movie, grabs the amulet, and throws it over the mountain? <laughs> Dracula's like, no! Put me in, coach! <laughs> you gotta see it. You'll look at Jonathan Grease differently after you see that movie. He'll be, he was also in <laughs> he'll be, uh, Real Genius. Right. Yep. Yeah, I, I looked at his IMDb. I don't recall him in that movie, but I've seen it, and I just don't remember it. He's the, He's the homeless the, guy, that, guy that he slept on the couch. Yeah. Oh yes, yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> what a career! That's a great fucking movie too. <laughs> I love that movie. Werewolf Wait, was he guy on the baked? couch. Who was the Who's the guy that was on the couch? I'm actually having like identity crisis, thinking like which one was which. Wait, the guy on the couch and half baked, I thought was Stephen Wright. That's Stephen Wright. Okay, never mind. Yeah, because in Real Genius, I mean, I think he also sleeps in. He's the the student that's like down in the basement or whatever it is, like the the unknown student. <laughs> Who just kind of like floats around? Yeah, just right. Just just saying the guy on the couch made me remember him though for yeah. some reason. So anyway, but anyway, he gets shot, and then we jump to Dell and his partner uh, Saper Sapir, who are investigating a missing mummy. Which I like how the partner asks the guard. So nobody took the mummy. I would have heard them. Of course he would have. A stupid question. Did you take him? No, sir. Just a shot. That's it, Bill. This case is too hard, man. Let's be fireman instead. I'm glad you're getting major laughs out of this, Rich. He does that at every crime scene. Did you kill this person? Uh, no. It's a numbers game. One of these times, they're going to break down and be like, <laughs> gonna, yes! Just, <laughs> that'll be the best night of his life. Oh, I can go home. Take him away, Choi's. <laughs> yeah, we have a missing mummy. And then they talk about how, yeah, 2,000-year-old dead guys don't just get up and walk away by themselves before s- smash cutting to the mummy just walking away by itself. Which I thought was kind of a cool... Oh, go ahead, Nick. Why was the mummy in the child's room? Um, to s- <laughs> don't, some, don't, someone wrote that scene. Don't ask more questions. So you thought it was don't cool that the mummy was walking questions. away? So, <laughs> so <laughs> I thought it was cool that the mummy is walking away, but then we kind of meld into the next scene naturally because it's the mummy's walking and then an ambulance goes by, and then the camera just immediately starts following the ambulance instead, which happens to be yeah, the one nice that has the Wolfman segue. transforming in it. Yeah, it's a good segue. So this was one of the the jump this, scares this sh- that got me as a kid. At which point the Wolfman when he transforming pops up behind, yeah, or yeah, when he, when it's the the driver just like listening to the radio or whatever, and then all of a sudden he just like pops up from the back seat and gets him. Right. I think that's the first time I'd ever seen a dead werewolf that is not transformed still transform and essentially heal his wounds. Because he was shot dead, and they pulled him out there. Because I'm pretty sure when the paramedics showed up to check the body, they're not just going to see an unconscious body with bullet holes in it and just take it away. I'm sure they would at least check for a pulse, do the typical run-of-the-mill stuff. So he was absolutely dead, and that's the first time I'd ever seen corpse become werewolf. Despite you know, that I thought that was interesting. I mean, it, unless yeah, it raises it's a interesting case that it's questions. More paperwork if he was alive. Well, I mean, from like a <laughs> just a mythology standpoint, jokes aside, I thought that was cool. Yeah, you never see that um, angle of it. It's they're always already transformed, and they're always invulnerable at that point. And you never see someone take pot shots at the untransformed werewolf. It's always just, oh, they're in full wolf form. Good luck killing them. Yeah, which I never crossed my mind until you mentioned it, that if they shot him at the police station, 
and now he's in a body bag, like in the ambulance or whatever, like somebody had to have like done a pulse check <laughs> to confirm he's actually dead. So yeah, he literally like wolfed out from a dead body and came back to life. So I don't know if it's just like a healing factor in this universe or what. It's like the Hulk. Yes. Honestly, it's okay. So sidebar, everybody go read the Al Ewing series, Immortal Hulk. It's kind of a horror take on the Incredible Hulk, but it's literally like Bruce Banner dies. And then that night when the, like the night starts, the moon comes up and whatnot. And then he transforms into the Hulk and regenerates and comes back from the dead. And it's, that's the first thing that came to mind when you described what happened to the Wolfman. So go read the Immortal Hulk. So is the Hulk a werewolf? The, yes. The, the, uh, canonically the, the The Hulk is a werewolf. Is that on Comixology? It is. It's actually on Comixology Unlimited. Is that what Dean has? Maybe I'll read that. Yeah. So, yeah, Wolfman. Um, The Wolfman, I only really have one problem with the Wolfman design, and it's that, well, maybe twofold. He seems too too top-heavy. I mean, the face is creepy. (laughs) He skips leg day, this werewolf. (laughs) This werewolf skips leg day. And also... It seems like he suffers from, is it Christopher, or is it, no, 1989, Michael Keaton, Batman, can't turn his head syndrome. <laughs> oh, uh, a lot of torso. His whole, sh- his whole shoulder has to turn uh, for him to look left and right. He can't, there's no head movement on it. And that that's just my only gripe with it. Like, it looks a little stiff. Which, I don't know the, the background in terms of the, the special effects for it, but I'm assuming then they probably had the the face controlled either like mechanically or something. And it was part of a rig that was probably his shoulders too. So he had to turn the full upper body instead of being able to just move at the neck. Yeah, probably. You're probably right. Cause it's definitely animatronic face. Well, I mean, you can tell he didn't really have a neck and because of the lack of neck and everything else, it makes sense that he would have to do the whole head turn. Yeah. That way. Yeah. It just makes him look a little stiff. I mean, Maybe he but um he just came back from the dead. He could be a little stiff. <laughs> I'm talking about the entire movie. Oh. Um but the face I do like the face. It's it's something it's very unique and weird looking, but also I mean it should be weird because he's a wolf man. Yeah. It makes it stand but, out. Uh, yeah, definitely. It scared me as a kid for sure. Yeah. I don't know why, but as a kid all of these types of like the werewolf look of the more, I don't know, like the the bipedal, a little bit more humanoid looking werewolves always were more fun to me than like, I love American Werewolf in London, but those kind of like the on all fours kind of werewolves, it was cooler when it was less wolf-like and more human. So it, it seemed less like, oh, he just turned into a wolf that's big. Like, yeah, that's a dire wolf. He turned into a dire wolf. <laughs> you don't like the uh, Twilight werewolves when they just straight up turn into like a timber wolf? <laughs> I don't think Twilight brought anything good to either mythology. <laughs> <laughs> heard it here first, folks. I don't think it's the first time they've heard it. You've heard it here shiny, many times, folks. Sh- shiny glistening skin in the sunlight. <laughs> Fabulous. Skin. The scorpion, the scorpion king in the Mummy Two was listed as one of the worst CGI effects of all time, until Twilight came out. <laughs> but which part? So uh, we stopped watching the movies by that point. But apparently, the babies that uh, <laughs> that are created are horrifying. Now I want to look it up. You'll wish you didn't. <laughs> so it's it's on par with Scorpion King. Let me tell you. But anyway. So back to the ambulance. So we're in the werewolf ambulance. We have the <laughs> the jump scare of him attacking the ambulance driver, all of that fun stuff. And then we I think get he breaks his neck. Yeah. And then we get to Sean and Dell sitting on the roof. Dell pops up and kind of brings him what I think was like eighties Burger King. It looked like that bag. Um Yeah. I think you're right. And I was I always wanted to be able to do this of just them sitting on their roof, eating fast food, and they're close enough to a drive-in that he's just sitting there with like a radio and binoculars, just listening in and watching the movie. I always wanted to do that. That is an awesome view of it, too. Yeah. Yeah. Which I don't know, like I've been to drive-ins, but I don't know of any ones that are 
that close to like a residential area that would then have <laughs> houses that can view it. It's a fantasy drive in. Yeah. So when I make my millions, I'm not going to have my own theater. I'm just going to have my house awkwardly built next to somebody else's drive in. <laughs> Is this zoned properly? It I might cost care. me seven million dollars to build and buy, but damn it, I'll save my twenty five dollars a car every weekend. I need soil. Oh my god. That first one can't be real, Nick. Sorry. It Nick is. just showed us it... pictures of the Twilight baby. That's yeah. real, the first one? <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Go look it up, listeners. Huh. <laughs> oh huh. yeah. I actually want to watch the Twilights now as a ironic horror movie thought of it. I think it's problem is it takes itself too seriously and they do riff tracks for at least a couple of them so you could you can make it enjoyable that way there you go dean early christmas present for me <laughs> so back at the swamp <laughs> i'm sorry <laughs> i'm trying so i like how dracula jump scares the wolfman now because of the wolfman's <laughs> like walking through the swamp and all of a sudden dracula just like pops up i just wanted to hear him do like oh <laughs> Very, very sneaky. So. Oh. so Dracula brings the gang together. But then the <laughs> mummy jump scares Dracula. <laughs> it's like a daisy chain. <laughs> it's like that one uh, meme online of, I forgot what show it is, of like the, them sitting in the church and one guy's holding the gun in front of him. And then the person sitting behind him is holding a gun on him. And then there's like a sniper up in the thing holding a gun on the third guy. It's just all of them <laughs> daisy chaining back and forth. <laughs> so I like how Dracula pulls out his staff points it to the pond and you see him focusing like he's like summoning something from there. And then the gill man pops out with the crate, which then Dracula has a look on his face. Like he makes like an office gym face. Like <laughs> I thought originally he was using his powers to pull the crate out as a kid. And then when the gill man shows up, it's just like, Oh no, it's just the gill man's pulling it out. But Dracula <laughs> reacted like he thought he was doing it. <laughs> I finally have the power. Why do you think he had this power? (laughs) (laughs) What if they just, it's because they let him go on thinking this for like ages. (laughs) He just broke the illusion. Yeah. Yeah, because he had like a Luke and Dagobah kind of thing going on. What if they continued letting him think that at the end of the movie, he like puts one hand out towards Sean to like grab the amulet and like he's straining and nothing's happening and everybody's just kind of like looking around. (laughs) (laughs) What are you doing, dude? Hold on, hold on. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I like the the look of all the monsters as the movie, as we mentioned. And I like how, like, as we said, like, Gilman, he's not Creature from the Black Lagoon, but he's still, like, a great... I think over a Gilman is the best-looking one out of the group. Yeah, he's, um, he's seamless. That's a yeah. one-piece suit. Yeah. They had Literally, to completely... Literally, like, that guy, got, that guy got strapped in there for hours during filming. <laughs> Yeah, they, the they really built it around me. him. The uh, the end yeah, they of the glued movie him in. You see, like close up. I wish he was in it more. Yeah, and then seeing him in the end, and then just super close up on his face as he's like moving toward his targets. It was really nice to see, and I thought they really put the most time into the wrong creature because he had the best makeup done throughout all the all the monsters. And he had the le- the least amount of screen time, which was kind of sad. Yeah, it seems like a major. I mean, other than Dracula, but a majority of it was all Wolfman throughout the movie. So it would have been great yeah, to have muscle. more Gilman. So I mean, uh, Gilman, it kind of gave me like a like Predator vibes in terms of the the seamlessness on the face work and whatnot. So yeah, we find out to everyone's surprise, the crate contains Frankenstein's monster. Which Dracula then uses his you mean staff. That, you mean it's, what? That it's stenciled on the outside of the crate. We didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, it did. I never noticed that. It's stenciled Frankenstein on the crate. Oh, but not so it belongs to monster. Frankenstein. Right. So it belongs <laughs> they, to Frankenstein. Dracula misinterprets it. He opens it, and it's just like Frankenstein's corpse. And he's just like, "Oh, <laughs> damn it! God damn it!" <laughs> why will i never learn so i like how then he takes his staff and pulls out like these two little pieces like these airpods 
throws him on Frankenstein's monster and then just lightning <laughs> rods him back to life. Yeah. Yeah, we get the this cool scene of all of them standing around the crate, the lightning striking, bringing Frankenstein's monster to life. The werewolf man howls at the moon, and then we have our commercial break. Join us Thursdays night at 8 for uh, Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. We all look forward to being with you on the next edition of Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. And uh, Was that the first commercial in your VHS cut? Oh, no, I, I had other ones. That's just the one that sticks out strongest in my mind. Because <laughs> I remember just that music cue and the howl, and then it goes to commercial break. I'll have to find that VHS copy someday. There's something nostalgic. Well, it's no surprise. There's something nostalgic specifically about finding them with their commercials and everything intact, as opposed to like, yeah, I can sit and I can buy the movie. I can watch the movie, but it's a different experience entirely to have it when you still have all of the commercials and ads and things from that time frame. It's my wife and I, We'll sometimes just go on YouTube and type in 1989 commercials and just like watch it's a 40 minutes of commercials. Yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah. Nostalgia Critic it's, has, I think, three different playlists and each one is about an hour and a half each of just commercials from the 90s. Yeah. Well, so. And it's so interesting to see how cheesy and stuff things were. Like, I don't know what we'll look at today's commercials, but th- th- it was just. They really like talk down to you on these commercials or like they treat people. I don't know. Well, I think they're now like they're movies. It's like they, the, 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 I don't know. Like just the, the approach to commercials was very, very different. Well, yeah. Now it's like they spent $600,000 to f- do a commercial. <laughs> it's like directed by Martin yeah. Scorsese starring like Clive Owen and <laughs> they Clive Owen. <laughs> filmed it in space or like something. I think yeah. also a big thing is. Because a lot of stuff now is streaming and you see the same ads over and over and over again, because we're not required to watch commercials to get through to the actual show, that a lot of people will probably not have that same connection that we did in previous years of like, oh yeah, like I remember this commercial, oh I was nostalgic for like that one. It's, yeah, now it's, you watch Hulu or something and oh yeah, our family doesn't pay for the ad free version. Okay, you're probably going to be seeing the same four commercials every single time forever that's a great point commercials are yeah they won't have the same as same effect some are making a comeback do you remember that um skittles berries and cream pardon me what kind of starburst did you just say berries 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 and what else and cream oh oh Berries and cream, berries and cream. I'm a little lad who loves berries and cream. Yeah, that's having a resurgence on TikTok. For Halloween, I want to see the Snickers commercial come back. Let me help you. Oh, uh, I'm only helping Snickers. We're definitely going to hurt. With like the, with like the two kids in the giant costume. So, dear listeners, during this commercial break that we're having right now, let us know all of your favorite nostalgic, like, commercials and Halloween time things from there, because th- this is a trip down memory lane. So, yeah, I the mean, first like... first person to tell us about a commercial, I'll, I'll just send you $5. I'll just <laughs> send you five bucks. Five pounds <laughs> sterling. So... <laughs> five USD. We come back from the the commercial break, and we have the uh, Emily putting Phoebe to bed before getting into it with Dell um, in the other room of them kind of arguing back and forth about his commitment to the family and their marriage and everything as Sean kind of sees this all going on, which I love how Sean looks at the message board that um, somebody must have taken the message down for him and sees that <laughs> <laughs> there was a message that someone was looking to reach him, a Mr. Alucard, maybe from school, asking about the journal, maybe some money in it. The cojones on Dracula to be like, hey, I'm going to use an anagram of my own name. <laughs> I it's mean, not it's even not an much... anagram. It's straight up backwards. True, yeah. <laughs> he just red rubbed it. He should have just said, you know, Dr. Acula called from the <laughs> nurse's office at school. <laughs> I was going to say, that reminded me of uh, 
the Mitch Hedberg joke. So I went to the doctor. All he did was suck my blood. Don't go see Dr. Acula. <laughs> Just a stupid little joke. That made me think of that. Well, like, how does Sean look at the thing and be like, oh, Mr. Alucard, yada, yada. And his immediate first thought was he just sits down, writes it down on a piece of paper, and he just starts, like, throwing the letters around. It's, well, why is that your first thought? He hasn't even been introduced to the idea that there's monsters out there yet, I thought. I've never heard of an Alucard. That has to be a bullshit name. I want to figure it out right now. But what were you saying, Nick? Well, plus two, the kid probably thought something was going on, considering that, um... Who's going to call him, you know? It's not like his car had an extended warranty someone wanted to talk to him about back then. (laughs) So it just seemed kind of sus to me. I wonder if there's a cutting room floor scene where I kind of want to see Dracula calling the house. (laughs) Like, uh, who is this? Uh, It's uh, it's Mr. Alucard. He sees his name written on, like, the wall, but he looks at a mirror. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> he looks in the mirror and he just sees the name but not himself it's just the phone hanging there <laughs> or yeah, even better if he looks around it's like wolfman reading a paper mummy like doing something he looks around panicked at all of them and they're like uh, 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 uh they're all fumbling uh, uh, alucard <laughs> nailed it <laughs> that's all so you're saying nick i did not like how the mother was so mad that the father was having to go out for work. I get that they were going to a counseling meeting, but on the flip side, it's not like he was going off for beers with his friends and coworkers. He was literally getting called into work. What do you want him to do? Yeah. And it's not a case of like, oh, it's just like we, you forgot your paperwork. It's no, there's like, there's a murder and the body's been missing. Now there's like other stuff going on. Um, so yeah, like it's a, it's a very precarious situation for all, old Dell there. This is where we get your favorite scene, Nick, or what it was it, Dean. Why is there a mummy in the closet? Yes. Why was there a mummy in the closet? So we get Eugene sitting in his room and he goes and he talks to his father and he's like, oh, there's a monster in my room. Damn son. Look at all of these monsters. Come on, all of you monsters, out of here. Everyone, out of this room. Come, ah, ah, you, on the bed. Come on, out, out, take a hike. There he goes. You see any more monsters? And then he's like, it's in the closet. So the father whips the closet open, but he doesn't look. And we just see in the background, the mummy in the closet. And then he closes the door and he's like, you're not doing any more of this monster stuff. And you're not sleeping in our bed tonight. (laughs) And then he leaves. Just long enough for the mummy to, like, make his escape. Which, first of all, how did the mummy get out of that closet and out the window without either of them noticing in that room? But more importantly, to your point, Nick, why is there a mummy in the closet? Maybe he was... I'm just I'm just now thinking this. Maybe he was trying to get the diary from... And he picked the wrong kid's house and he just... He feels safe in a closet. He's like, I want to take a nap. And he just went into the closet like a sarcophagus. That's, that's, I, what, I'm, that's what I'm guessing. I, I think Dr. Doctor Acula picked the wrong henchman to do his <laughs> busy work. His doc. He's like looking at his hand in the closet and like the name is smudged. The address is missing. And he's like, oh, stupid. <laughs> Just, just wait it He's out. like, werewolf, you out. remember six. Mommy, you remember two. <laughs> <laughs> the mommy comes out. Excuse me, sir, can I use your phone? <laughs> yeah, it's it's ridiculous, but it's a funny scene just because of the, the whole joke is the dad not seeing the mummy, in the, which is funny, but it doesn't make too much sense. I mean, it would have been a hard left turn if he whips it open and the mummy grabs him. <laughs> Then later, instead of like, mommy was at my house, Eugene's like, the mummy killed my father. This kicks uh, Sean into high freaking gear. This is when he forms the official Monster Squad. Okay, Ra here. What's the deal? Yeah, what the hell's Monster Squad? It's us. We're the Monster Squad. Since when? Since now. What's a squad? He fills everyone in on the, the whole Wolfman mummy situation from the info he got from his father. And then... I love how smug Rudy looks 
when they're talking about, yeah, there was a guy who got shot and disappeared, but it's probably because they didn't shoot him with silver bullets. And Rudy just like smirks to himself. <laughs> <laughs> I got that one right. Got it. So, so uh, fun fact, Eugene is played by Michael Faustino, who is the younger brother of Bud Bundy, David Faustino from Married with Children. That's all. It's true. Fun fact. Also, fun fact, how late are these kids allowed to be out and about? Because, like, isn't it they're all, like, Eugene was supposed to be in bed to go to sleep, but then directly following the <laughs> cut to Sean doing this scene of bringing them all to the clubhouse, and I, it's nighttime, so is it the following night, or is this the same night, and all of them just snuck out to come to the clubhouse? I think it's the same night. They probably just, later on, the dad uses a walkie. So I think they've probably got a walkie system going like, on. Not a not tin can and string like three ninjas, but probably <laughs> sure more they reliable. Did have a walkie talkie used a couple of times through the the movie. They just um it was more toward the end. Yeah. Which I mean this makes me kind of like really nostalgic for childhood of like doing your stuff during the day and then doing dinner and then being like and round two at night and just like getting all the neighborhood kids. Can Tim come out to play? Come out to play. All my friend that shows up. So, um, <laughs> Rudy's smug. The kids are all grouped up. And Rudy realizes that the girl he's been uh, scoping out next door is Patrick's sister, which is a surprise to him. Which I like how then the Monster Squad does an all hands in thing. And it's the close up of all their hands, and all of a sudden the dog paw. <laughs> How does that dog get up here anyway? That was an actual <laughs> laugh out loud moment. I like that one. <laughs> I mean, it's funny in situations like that where it's the character has the natural response that anybody would actually have. And then it's just the novelty of like, no, yeah, that's my actual response to this. <laughs> then we go back to the Drac pack at Drac's mansion. who We find out he has a secret underground lair activated by like shaking hands with this statue. That looks like the mayor, of, uh, the founder of Springfield. <laughs> yes. So Not I even subtle. It looked like the actual yeah. statue. Jebediah Springfield. <laughs> yes. <laughs> also remember, he didn't build this place. He this was here. This was already here. So this was actually what Van Helsing's. Yeah. Or does this mean that somebody else? Wait. So I thought the amulet ended up in the portal when they did the portal at the beginning of the movie. So it was at this point in it the is podcast the where I realized that uh, the there's a certain movie. level of uh, suspension of disbelief <laughs> and you just got to go with it. And then the whole rest of the movie makes so much more sense. So Dean, you're starting to ask too many questions as I did. Oh yeah. Just don't. Oh yeah. <laughs> it does look like Jebediah Springfield. Doesn't it? <laughs> So we find I out almost that... I almost want to put them like side by side. <laughs> <laughs> so we have uh Frankenstein's monster is imprisoned in the basement of Drac's mansion and then he gets given the mission by Drac to go kind of like get this journal and take out the kids and whatever the case may be here which Did You say Drac? Yeah, Drac, Dracula. <laughs> Life's too short You're to on say a short, full names, man. You're on a short name basis with Dracula? <laughs> So I, so I can say the drag pack. <laughs> that's a good, that's good. That's a good name. Sorry to interrupt. So he sends Frankenstein out to go get the, well, Frankenstein's monster out to, I also say Frank in all of my notes. So it's Drac, Frank, um, Wolfman's just Wolfman. So this is when we actually get introduced completely to the character known as Scary German Guy, because why give him a name? So one of the things that I love in this movie, which kind of goes hand to hand, hand in hand with our trope episode except this is kind of doing things the way I would want it to be done, is throughout this, like, growing up as a kid, I only caught on to certain little things, but now rewatching it, like, they never explicitly mention anything involving Scary German Guy being, like, say, a Holocaust survivor or anything like that. But when we have the scene of him talking about... You sure know a lot about monsters. Now that you mention it, I suppose I do. He closes the door and you see the tattoo on his arm. I'm trying to give you the limelight in this movie. And I think that was probably the biggest offense that I took. And because it happened so early and 
I knew he was a Holocaust survivor pretty quick before seeing the tattoo, and that just kind of cemented it in because of just his demeanor, having the World War II bomber, and then you could see the menorah right next to his um, window. Oh, like I, I knew, like I didn't notice the menorah. Yeah, I yeah, that. I knew this guy's definitely. I see it now. A survivor, and it just it made stars kind of aligned and i i kind of felt that was the case and then when he closed the door i'm like yep that that did it and then just with how cruel they treated him through the whole movie and then the icing on the cake they didn't give him a fucking name i really lost a lot of points through the whole movie because of it i never realized growing up that he never actually is even in the credits he's listed as scary german guy and it's just like really (laughs) They don't even give him, like, a name in the script other than Scary German Guy. It's really disappointing. Yeah. Especially with how many lines he has. Yeah. Yeah, really. Like, he does a great job, and I think I I love his character in terms of what they've done with him in kind of developing in the short time they've had with him and kind of, like, introducing us to him and everything. So it's just kind of a smack in the face when it's, yep, we never give him a name. Like, really? (laughs) So. Forever in our hearts, Scary German Guy. SGG. So we <laughs> get an homage to the original Frankenstein as Phoebe's playing with flowers by the pond and Frank shows up. And then we jump back to Scary German Guy's house when we have... <laughs> so my family and I, we are still say this to this day. He's uh, holding the knife and he says, Time is almost up. And then it pans over to him cutting the pie and he's like, It's your last chance for pie thanks now, Mr. here we Dad. go <laughs> and it's just become a phrase that like we use uh which is great which this guy the kids hassle him outside and they like always watch his house and yet still he brings them in gives them pie and helps them read this journal and kind of discuss this with them like he finds out the ritual for the like involving the amulet and how it's involved to shift the balance to evil or open a vortex to uh, suck up everything, which the journal is clear support on why proper documentation on any task is always needed. Because if Van Helsing just like, oh, that's fine. We had a conversation. I don't need to write it down. This would not have happened. (laughs) Good thing. So kudos for proper documentation there, Van, which then brings us back to the clubhouse, which Rudy is evidently at the some sort of like the the natural diner that all kids go to and the squad goes to the diner to find rudy they ask him does he know of any virgins which gets a spit take for us before (laughs) phoebe introduces the squad to frankenstein's monster and naturally everybody does their panic running hiding in trash cans hiding under things and all that fun stuff from there which first of all like i like the music they use it's kind of like frankenstein monster theme i don't know if it's used throughout the rest of the movie but it's used um, specifically here for him and Phoebe. And then Sean is the first one to kind of listen to Phoebe and actually come out from hiding to meet Frankenstein's monster. And this is when he kind of gets incorporated into the monster squad officially. Especially seen as he accidentally ends up snapping lewd pics of the girl next door. Um, <laughs> To rephrase, it's not so much lewd pics. He's literally peeping Tom through the window. So nude pics. We don't know because of that. I'm pretty sure it probably is. Oh, but it's not so knows. much just the just not so much that. It gets to the point where when he goes to develop it, I expect the cops to be there when he goes to pick them up. <laughs> they just put the cuffs on Rudy. She just wouldn't happen to live next door, would she? Yeah, so what? That girl's your sister? Like, yeah, that's... Uh... <laughs> You're going back to juvie. Yeah. My only real problem with the thing is the movie does I mentioned earlier was like the blackmail. Like that, that didn't sit right with me. That, yeah. Yeah. That that was strike. <laughs> that's the two only and part three. that was like, ooh. Yeah, that was really that, that's a little too much. Really fucked up. And um What if instead of going with them on that, she's just like, Yeah, let me just grab something. She goes to like a phone booth, makes a call to the cops, and then they come and cuff Rudy. You guys are sick. Guess what? Fox Photos got a two-for-one deal this week, and wouldn't you know it, there's a space on the bulletin board right between the prom committee notes and the football roster. (laughs) You're going back to Juvie. (laughs) 
This is a fixed point in the timeline, Rudy. No matter what, you're back in juvie. Give me those cool Michael Jackson shoes. You're never wearing these again. You'll never catch me. And he just starts moonwalking away. (laughs) They just (laughs) casually walk up to him and cuff him. No, they're so, like, dumbfounded. How's he doing that? (laughs) He's a witch. Shoot him. The deputy from before shows up and just fires six shots yeah. into him. Close up on him as he just sh- yeah unloads all of his rounds. <laughs> he was a oh, I just realized Frankenstein took the picture. Yeah, that's right. One, he he took one picture by accident. Yeah, and it was right as she was disrobing. Yeah, but he um, Rudy took a lot more of those. No, Frank took the uh, the naked one. You know. Yeah, I thought Rudy was just being a voyeur i didn't realize that anybody was taking pictures prior i thought frankenstein had just found the camera and took the picture so yeah so that means it wasn't accidental they had been a creepy (laughs) little thing going on there for a while (laughs) yeah so lock them up so anyway we get the sad scene of them introducing frankenstein's monster to a frankenstein's monster mask where he kind of sees the mask And then he kind of understands that that's his face and realizes that he can't take it off and that he is scary, which again, Tom Noonan, great job as Frankenstein's monster. Yeah. It just, it's funny. It it brings that element into it. Like that, um, almost like the self-realization, like short circuit. Like he's like, disassemble means death. Just like he has this self, uh, awareness all of a sudden. He just starts peeling his face. Remembering. They're like, no, 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 no. <laughs> oh. <laughs> they show up, he's wearing horse's face. <laughs> oh, God. We shouldn't have let a monster into our club. I look happy now. <laughs> My name is Horace. <laughs> uh. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so we get this iconic shot. Of the the squad walking like over the hill into the sunset with Frankenstein's monster in tow, which I always love the like it's it's a great shot. It's one of the things that I always remember from this movie from childhood. But his platforms, his platform boots, (laughs) Frankenstein's like, I don't know why they didn't make his shoes a little more or maybe just bigger all around instead of just adding six inches to the bottom of the soul. <laughs> well, wasn't that always just one of the things about Frankenstein? He had platform shoes. Like, I remember I Herman Munster had them. Right. I've never seen the original Frankenstein, so I'm not sure what the Boris Karloff I guess if they're looks like. doing homage, yeah, maybe. I thought he had big boots, but I never thought he had, like, actual, like, platforms. Yeah, I'm not sure. I know his face very well, because that's the shot you always see. Yeah. And it's very rare to see the full body, or at least his shoes anyway. Yeah. I'm looking at a shot of Frank, the OG Frankenstein, and he just has like massive like boots that maybe like have an inch or two built inside. They're not like straight up just extensions <laughs> of the of the bottom of the of the shoe. To make it less noticeable, they have to make them wide too. So he's just has these like three by three feet. <laughs> Clown feet. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, yeah, it's a good shot. It's a nice shot, actually. Yeah. Happy Frankenstein family. So we go back to the Drax mansion, and he finds the amulet, but it's kind of, like, behind this wall down in that basement. And it's guarded by, like, all the the garlic and the crosses and everything. And I like how, as he's getting excited talking about, like, nobody can stop us, you visibly see him spinning. Bidding every single line in that scene and i never noticed it until i watched it now and it's like yeah you really notice it against that like green background light got it in hd too you're not gonna see yeah. it in a low res the wolfman also is like capable of using tools he's like wielding the hammer and carrying the lantern ah so he can open doors <laughs> yeah <laughs> probably just see him googling things on the computer Wolfman, we are out of supplies. And you see him like standing in line at a Home Depot and he has like a tool belt, hacksaw, sledge. Do you take debit? <laughs> I don't have my rewards card for Home Depot. Can you look it up by my number? 666. 666. Six, 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 six. Area code? You're not going to believe it. 
<laughs> so <laughs> we this is when we get the montage. So we get the montage of the kids casually using school supplies to make weapons. Like um, bullets. Yeah, Rudy, so Rudy's at school and he's like in wood shop making wooden stakes in whatever class making bullets um <laughs> stealing arrows from like the archery class or something. So clearly their entire weaponry side of things is entirely because of Rudy. Cuz we see like Patrick is like making copies so he can cut out the cards or something like that. Great, you have business cards. Rudy has literally provided every single weapon for you. <laughs> I absolutely... Mr. Johnson, do you have those bullet molds? <laughs> oh yeah. I I absolutely believe that Steve Harrington was taken from Rudy. I could see so that. much inspiration is there that it's really hard. I wouldn't put it past the Duffer Brothers. Yeah. 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 Because, I mean, considering all the other references and things, they had to have grown up watching Monster Squad. So it's it would only be natural for some of that to either bleed in unconsciously or be a homage, like, purposely. Absolutely. Right. So, yeah. Rudy is making all sorts of weapons. The, the rest of the kids. So that one vampire circus poster in their clubhouse during the scene was stuck in my head for years because for some reason I kept seeing that like it's the the blue and black poster of the face open with the the fangs and I never realized what it was from I thought it was just a poster in this movie and then I found out it's from a a movie called Vampire Circus never saw it just for anybody else who grew up seeing that poster in this movie and wondering that's what it is Meanwhile, Eugene sends a crayon letter to the military. That works. That that Later works. <laughs> That's all it took. Dear Army. <laughs> Dear Mr. Dracula. <laughs> I know who you are. I know what you are. <laughs> so, yeah. So what school allows Rudy to melt down silverware and make actual bullets? And then Rudy goes to expose the uh the photos or like pick up the photos and realizes that frankenstein's monster took those scandalous pictures as we then jump to frankenstein's monster holding the pictures up looking at them as all the kids are jumping around them why is patrick one of the ones jumping after it (laughs) oh boy stop asking questions tim i mean (laughs) unless he's either a not aware of what the picture is he was just told like oh frankenstein has like scandalous photos or if he's kids if you tell them they're not included in this group what's the first thing they're gonna want to do right they're gonna want it in. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Like, oh no, you can't see this. This is for big kids <laughs> only. And of course, the kid's gonna be like, "I'm a big kid. I want to see." <laughs> Which I don't know if it was he didn't know what was going on, or if he was doing it to like reclaim or honor. Like, he has to destroy them. <laughs> I think. <laughs> I, I think it would have been more messed up if it was Phoebe trying to look. <laughs> <laughs> I think that or your Del. theory of like kid being left out like that applies would apply to phoebe she's like i want to see i don't she doesn't know what it is yeah really yeah dance until you drop it's gonna be in my head now what is that song what's that song dance until you drop i'm gonna use that as the segue in between each section of this episode <laughs> <laughs> forget the screen that, refresh whoosh here comes dance throws, until you drop just just throw some uh, reverb just on it dance drop dean fine. The old triple D's. <laughs> Dance yeah. until you drop. So we go back to Drax Mansion a third time. I like how, so the Wolfman's tied up because Dracula he understands like the human version is against him. The Wolfman is with him. So he has him tied up waiting for him to transform. And I like how he's like, oh, I'm going to go like do something else. Why don't you change into something more comfortable? Dracula's got jokes, uh, evidently. <laughs> <laughs> before he goes to the closet and has what I assume is three like girls in there um, as like a snack of some sort. They were definitely snacks. Um, why were they all dressed the same? Yeah, it looked like some sort of school uniform type deal, but all of them looked like they were in college. And I'm like, what? Do, is there like a college uniform? Dracula, I just have to say, is like really 
sinister in this movie. Like, yes, he's the villain, but he's like fucked up. Like, this is the chaotic evil where there is just like, I want world domination or I want to destroy the earth. And that's it. Yeah. You do know you're on this earth, right? If you destroy it, you're, you're gone too. <laughs> I've never understood that. It's like, what, what's your end game there? I'll destroy the world and like then Ivan what? Ooze, like first the world, first Angel Grove, then the universe. It, you kind of live here too, dude. Yeah, you have a vested interest, buddy. Yeah, I mean, maybe we'll just assume he's going to keep a small population of humans uh, to feed upon. Yeah, because he may be well, immortal, but he still needs monsters. The blood. Yeah, he didn't. While monsters just uh, we're, we're think take over. We're thinking too deep into it. Yeah. Why was that mummy in the... Cl- no, so as a kid, I <laughs> felt bad for the Wolfman. Just because... It, it, so he escapes. Like, he spits his pills out. He was able to get out of the ropes. He escapes. He gets to the phone booth so he can call, the like, the police. So he can warn Dell of Dracula being after his son and trying to, like, help him. Every step of the way, the Wolfman is just, like, trying to fix this. And just keeps getting waylaid by his own lycanthropy. Because then he tr- does a... F- cool phone booth transformation which i always liked uh, he's gonna kill your son ah! 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 Um, before kind of like bursting from the phone booth howling and then just like running off into the night which i thought was just like it always as a kid seemed spookier than anything else of just a very like not he doesn't even do it in like a a purposely creepy way it's just literally he just blows out of the phone booth and just starts like running off into the distance it's more effective when you're not trying to be effective because he's on the loose i wish he was able to convey his message to uh dad cop a lot better than how he did it (laughs) i'm also surprised dad cop didn't take it as seriously because i don't think that many people would have known that they shot and killed somebody the night before screaming they were a werewolf i would have remembered something like that and the yeah. voice would have been the same but again thinking too much you know what he should have done he should have said like i'm coming i'm coming to kill your son like this is where I'll be, i'm gonna kill your son like he should have acted as the threat like just to get him Kind of like our point earlier, where you don't call the police and be like, "There's a werewolf." Uh, yeah. There's aliens coming to get me. It's like, no, it's a guy with a gun. He's shooting. He's got a gun. People. <laughs> He's got a gun. No! Don't you fire! <laughs> I like how. So then they would just show up and they would be like Dracula there, and they're, "Did you see a guy with a gun?" No. They they just get back in their car. <laughs> I guess not. Okay. <laughs> Where's the gun? He reached into his jacket. You see any uh, morphological being around here lately? No? Okay. <laughs> Dad's until you trap. So Rudy and Patrick try to figure out if the sister is a virgin, and they resort to blackmail to get her to join. Yep. <laughs> not great. Um, wasn't Using great at the, the time. Naked photo. Not great now. I still think it would have been terrific if she was just like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call the police. And then just both of them get <laughs> locked up. And then the rest of the monster squad is like at the mansion, like, where's Rudy and Patrick? <laughs> Just nope. Which means nobody stops the mummy, which means everything butterflies effects from there. I think Eugene, there might be something wrong with Eugene. He doesn't scream at anything. Eugene's seen some stuff. <laughs> it's just like a thousand yard stare, and he's just like, creature took my Twinkie. <laughs> Mummy came to mind. I house. want that kid in battle with me later on in life. <laughs> Level headed. Yeah. Because it's, if he was like Rudy's age, I think he would be their ace in the hole of just like, yeah, nothing shakes Eugene. <laughs> Eugene is fucked up. Dude. <laughs> Eugene is going to be that kid that just like gets really big into knife collecting in his teens. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so Eugene loses his Twinkie to the creature, which, like, he drops it in the water. At that point, it's not really yours anymore, bud. Even if you got it back, would you have eaten that? Still in the wrapper, dude. It's true. I guess. It's sealed. I want to rewind a little it's bit back to the montage, and seeing that 50s-style diner really brought me flashbacks to the Happy Days television show, and I really do yeah. miss that show in general. And I always wanted to go to a diner like that. 
I oh yeah, like I love the idea of having your own like local haunt kind of thing of like, oh yeah, we all get together at such and such. Just grab a burger and hang out. I feel like it's that's not a thing anymore. <laughs> or maybe it's because we didn't grow up in an area that was good for that, I guess, because it wasn't just like, oh yeah, it's like everybody it's local. Everybody's scattered. Well we town. uh we used to hang out at the truck stop and ate at Wendy's. It was true. T- I mean not my crowd, yeah. but we it was uh twenty four hours, so we were able to pretty much go whenever we wanted. I think we just skateboard out to the McDonald's and order like five double cheeseburgers <laughs> with friends. Cashier would be like, "Fuck!" When they saw always us paying with in. quarters and <laughs> pennies. <laughs> we did pay with like not all change, but just scrounging together change dollars. So mom and dad. Speaking of McDonald's, sidebar. Nick will remember this. So we used to get do something we called like the the annual summer sleepover, like our annual get together, um, with uh, Nick, myself, my brother, and David, who was on one of our Rule of Thirds episodes, friend of the show. Originally, we were younger, so when it was oh we're gonna do our get together, the first time we did it, my mother was like, "Here's some cash for you guys to if you go to like order food or something or." Because we were like, oh, maybe we'll do like the, the, we'll order Chinese food or we'll do like the buffet or something. What we decided instead is let's take all this cash, go to McDonald's and just go nuts on their dollar menu back when it was actually a dollar. So I never realized that they have big bags at McDonald's, like with a handle, because we ended up getting just like, give us 25 apple pies, give us 20 chicken nuggets, <laughs> give me 30 McDoubles, give me 30 McChickens. Give me all of your apple pies. Now, son, I know I know what you think you heard. I mean all of your apple pies. <laughs> we, we subsisted entirely off like $65 a dollar menu McDonald's, like three liters of pineapple soda, and just bad movies the entire time. It was great. You would just like, sounds people fun. would peter out and pass out and then just like wake up during the night and be like, oh, and just reach into the pile and just grab like more chicken nuggets and an apple pie. <laughs> just a homogenous pile yeah. of people would just be like trailing food. around at like sunrise and it would just be who kind of finally crashed and just passed out on the couch who decided like, I'm just going to go up to my bed because it's my own house kind of deal. It's great times. So never <laughs> knock a. Uh, hassling for a lot of food at mcdonald's not sponsored (laughs) naturally they're at the mansion that was our commercial break by the way so back to the mansion so we have horace after (laughs) frankenstein's monster warns them that dracula wants them dead horace then decides like um sean maybe we can be like mask squad instead you know do math problems stay home or nature squad we could look at rocks collect birds not be dead. See, it's this whole death thing I'm not crazy about. They decide to go into the mansion by themselves. It's just them uh, with Frankenstein's monster. And then as Dracula uses more dynamite that they have access to to blow up the uh, walls holding back the amulet down in his basement, this causes the house to kind of shift and the roof to fall in on Frankenstein's monster, which Sean completely writes off as a loss immediately. <laughs> Don't call him a monster. But what if he's dead? Then he died to help us. <laughs> he's gone. Yeah, they There's rushed to him do. and he's just like, he's dead. He's gone. That's it. I love how immediately it happens to the, all of one, us someday. the one person that could help him through all of this is immediately taken out of the game within the first 10 seconds. I mean, how great would it have been? They walk in, the roof collapses, and all of them just like 180 and they're like, okay, and we're out. And they just hop over the body and leave. Sorry, sirs. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it makes it more effective later, but I do wish we could have seen Frankenstein kick a little ass before yeah, getting sidelined. Just a gentle giant. Again, it does make it effective later on yeah. when he does show up. I mean, unless it's like Superman syndrome where they know the stakes get lowered if Frankenstein's monster is like in the party because it's, oh, the Wolfman comes out. Yeah, but I mean, like, Frankenstein's monster doesn't have nerve endings. He can't really be hurt. So, like, can he fight the Wolfman to a draw? Like, what's the deal here? Even though I would have loved to have seen that. 
The immovable object against the unstoppable force. Especially if they gave Frankenstein's monster a gun. I found this under <laughs> my dad's bed. It's always a, it's always a snub nose, too. <laughs> the Frankenstein's monster like <laughs> leans over and just pulls it out of his boot. <laughs> the Wolfman, huh? Frankenstein, badass. <laughs> oh gosh. So yeah, so Frankenstein gets uh, KO'd immediately, and they kind of write him off as dead. Which I like how Sean's answer to all of this is like, we have complete faith in we can do this because we have Frankenstein's monster on our side. And my dad's a cop. And if anybody messes with us, my dad will kick their ass. <laughs> so those are the two he has in the chamber. Frankenstein's monster and his dad. Which Frankenstein's monster is out of the game because of that roof collapse. So he better get to calling his dad. Speaking of the roof collapsing, I do think it's funny that we see uh, Dracula wiring up that dynamite. <laughs> it just seems funny to me, like him using tool using tools. Well, it would have been funnier know. if it, he had the Wolfman do it. Wolfman has, like, one of those minor light helmets. And he's just, like, sitting there, and he has, like, a screwdriver in his teeth, and he's just, like, fiddling with wires. The helmet has cutouts for his ears. (laughs) (laughs) These are all the things Uh, that we didn't get in this movie. (laughs) This is all very, like, Saturday the 14th kind of stuff. (laughs) Yeah, so we end up getting the, the scene of them kind of talking about, oh, like, we should go back, and Sean kind of making a stand of, like, if we leave now, Frankenstein's monster died for nothing. We got to go ahead. We got to find this amulet. And then the Wolfman jumps into the scene from offsides. Quite literally. Which, how long was he there? Did he just come in at the end of this speech? Was he like, I don't want to be rude. I was told to kill you, but not to be rude. Never to interrupt. <laughs> there are some things this wolf form does not stop. Common decency. I <laughs> like how... Sean immediately says, Kick him in the nose! Kick him in the nose! Immediately. Immediately. That's the first choice. And Horace questions it. He's incredulous. At which point he does kind of lay a stiff boot to the cash and prizes of the Wolfman. And we get the <laughs> iconic line, Wolfman's got an heart! What if that just took the Wolfman out the rest of the movie? He's just like dry heaving. Just his head explodes immediately. <laughs> like a rock'em sock'em robot. He just kicks him. His neck and spine just shoot up and his head hits the ground. <laughs> it's a perfect alignment. I just sent the shockwave. <laughs> yep. <laughs> just Maybe just Horace just has that ability just start kicking everyone in the nose. It's a secret explodes. weapon. He's just going around all the monsters at the end of the movie just kicking them in the... <laughs> My is name that... is Horace. And he just, <laughs> boom. My name is Horace. <laughs> just like, is that one punch man who like explode, people explode or who explodes when they punch him? I mean, they don't specifically explode when he punches them, but yeah, he takes oh. them out in one punch. I mean, some Got of them you. do explode. Isn't there some character that when he punches somebody they just like start to like slowly expand and explode i think that's uh the main character from fist of the north star that's prop that's what i'm thinking of yeah that's all so yeah he's like that but kicking them in the nuts (laughs) (laughs) it's like foot of the north foot of the south star my name is (laughs) horace So that would have been a much different <laughs> ending if he finds the shotgun and then there's no shells and he throws it on the ground and just kicks Gilman in the groin. And then the two bullies come out and they're like, hey, great job. And he walks up and he just pop, pop, gets both of them. <laughs> and then finally Foot Dracula's the like, let star. me in that vortex, please. <laughs> Finish the incantation. <laughs> Horace just stomping down the street after him. (laughs) I'm a virgin. I'll do it. Move. Let me die. (laughs) Yeah, so the Wolfman's got nards. So the boys get cornered by Drac, the brides, and the Wolfman. Sean is convinced there has to be a secret passage in this place and finds Jebediah Springfield's lever arm and launches (laughs) them down into the basement. Meanwhile, back at the diner, we have the the happy days of uh, Patrick, Rudy, and the sister just hanging out. Back to the basement. I like how Van Helsing clearly protected the amulet from vampires, but didn't account for literally anyone else grabbing it. 
He has crosses and garlic and whatnot in here. But did he ever account for the fact that it's like Dracula could have had like just a normal undead thing come in here if that's the case? Any of his henchmen come in? A normal human being come in? Yeah, there's no other booby traps. Yeah. It looks like he was the final test for the monster squad and boy, did he fail it. Yeah. <laughs> he blew it. Be keeping little. What if there was another booby trap? He grabs the amulet and then just like a blade comes down. Sean. Just like the last crusade. <laughs> the Head starts rolling. Only the penitent man may pass. I remember that from <laughs> Van Helsing's journal. <laughs> Which, okay, so side note. Last crusade. Only the penitent man may pass. Great. That means you have to kneel down. The blade goes over his head. The only thing is, in the movie, there's then a second blade that comes out of the floor vertically. Because he ducks and then he does a barrel roll. And goes past that second blade. Where in the well, penitent man may pass? Yeah, it it's a lost scroll um, from the Bible. <laughs> yeah, what the penitent man about, may pass only if he then does a barrel roll to follow it up. When they prayed, they did they barrel rolled out of the prayer. That was <laughs> that was well known. And the dismount. Amen. <laughs> it was a lost. It was one of the tablets that were smashed when Moses came down from the mountain <laughs> with these fifteen. These Ten Commandments. <laughs> <laughs> Thou shalt shoulder roll after <laughs> praising God. Thou shalt do a barrel roll. Do another <laughs> barrel roll. <laughs> so, yeah. Sorry, I can just imagine. I just imagine the clips coming in. <clears throat> um. So, yeah, he gets the amulet. And congratulations. And he walks out of that room and immediately gets nabbed by Dracula. Which, luckily... Horace then thinks quickly, unwraps his lunch, and then slaps a <laughs> slice of garlic pizza on Dracula that instantly starts searing his flesh. How much garlic was on that pizza? <laughs> Pocket pizza. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody expects pocket pizza. It's a whole pie. He just lays it over the top of his head. Which also, why didn't he, like, he's already getting Dracula. Why doesn't he just follow it up? Just keep doing it. Yeah, man. I guess you're just shocked that it works at that point. You're like, holy shit, or he's burning. do it, and then all three of them just, like, muscle him into the room with all the crosses and garlic, and then they wall him <laughs> up like a cask of Amontillado. Dracula, in this moment, just sounds like he's through with just being Dracula, because he just, he grabs him by the, you know, the collar, he's like, give it to me! <laughs> give it to me! <laughs> give it to me! <laughs> like that that cool calm demeanor is gone he's just yelling at him <laughs> yeah it's like over time it went from like all smirks and smugness and now it's like give me the damn amulet desperation i'm sick of this shit i got things to do i got places to go i'm still paying monthly on this house so. i'm underwater <laughs> i'm underwater on this home we're gonna flip it <laughs> well yeah that just made me laugh when he's just yelling yeah who wants to buy a house in the swamps <laughs> in this neighborhood how is there a swamp and a mansion in this neighborhood <laughs> luckily they're able to escape because phoebe arrives with their friend the scary german guy and his jeep followed by rudy and the gang showing up in the on their bikes at the same time which I guess I don't I didn't see them have their bikes with the Jeep. So I'm assuming then they rode their bikes there and then just left their bikes and all took the car. Well, desperate Sounds times. Legit. So they head to the church because monsters hate religious stuff, which they're not wrong. Which I think the so when they're driving to the town center, we'll get to the town center. I'm pretty sure that's the same town center from um I think like Gremlins and other things. Yeah, that's uh, the Warner Brothers back lot for sure. Oh, so it's been in a movie I, or two. <laughs> we've been there. <laughs> we as in us or we as in like the royal we? Did I, did I not take you there when you came out? You did not. Oh, I'm I, sorry. I would like to it's go. Yeah, because when I saw it, it, I immediately thought of, even though Back to the Future is yeah. a stronger one, I actually first thought of Gremlins because I feel Back yeah. to the Future uses the centerpiece primarily, whereas Gremlins use the side streets a lot more. Even though it's the same yeah. lot. Yep, that's Warner Brothers. Yeah, next time we come out, Dean, instead of uh, the... taking me to the Karate Kid Beach, <laughs> we'll we'll go check that out. Yeah, for sure. 
Yeah, so they take off in the Jeep, and then they avoid hitting the mummy, who then hitches a ride on the back of their truck. Patrick grabs the mummy's claw. Great dexterity on that mummy. <laughs> he just grabs, tears both of his arms out because he has no muscle system. <laughs> it just takes off, and he's just standing there, and you just have two arms hanging off the back of the car. <laughs> so, first of all, terrific that this mummy does not have the same magic usage as Emotep from the Brendan Fraser mummy, because... Evidently, all he can do is just kind of, like, be vaguely menacing. Yeah, I don't know anything about the Universal Mummy. Like, did he just lumber and, like, kill people I think people so. Um, I felt the same, too, watching this. Because it just made me think of the classic Universal one. And I never really understood its appeal. Because yeah. the Brendan Fraser Mummy, at least that one had more of a black magic aspect to him. Yeah, there was, like, menace to him. Yeah, Whereas like God the mummy, I mean, how scary is it to see a very slow lumbering, like you, a, a strong wind can blow this guy over? When Uncle yeah. Rico swerved, no, um, old scary guy swerved to avoid him, I thought in my head, like, I would have just, I was just hit him. It would have just exploded in a cloud of dust. <laughs> what if he's just really dense? They do hit him and the Jeep just folds around him. All of them are dead. <laughs> Dracula comes out. He just, oh, wow. That's how it could have gone. So Patrick grabs the mummy's cloth, hands it to Rudy. Rudy ties it to an arrow, shoots it into a tree, and then they unravel the mummy. First monster dead. Put one on the board for Rudy. Boom. So while this is all going on, we go back to the, the father and his partner. So Dell, they're in the squad car taking off to go kind of help with all of this because of like the the call and everything and they encounter Dracula's hearse who runs completely through their vehicle startling them like Zedmore in the uh yeah under the, with the ghost train this made me laugh cuz modern cops would have been so angry for anyone trying to play chicken with them <laughs> <laughs> well like the partner just leans out of the car and starts firing politics aside with your modern stance on police i mean in all seriousness you know how mad that cop would have been if you even remotely attempted to play chicken with them yeah. <laughs> or they at least would have been like yep gotta yeah, rest you would have turned that car around so fast which evidently they do it too slow because by the time that they get there well first of all cool little thing is when dracula is headed towards the house they cut to the mother up in the house and you see her candle just like go out when Dracula's getting nearby. But then Dracula plays zero games and then just dynamites the clubhouse and he walks away from the explosion. He's like, meeting adjourned. His, it's like, his face around. is just like, was that I'm for you? sick of this shit. Yeah. He was cutting it close too because he let that fuse before he got to the backyard and by the time he threw it it actually looked more like he dropped it instead of threw it because that he had half of a it was it was it was done the fuse was already lit <laughs> again just the yeah, jack dracula is just a fucked up like just the that he's dynamiting kit or he thinks he is dynamiting people like also so that means he just must have bought the dynamite for the the amulet room and it was just like well i mean i have all this extra dynamite <laughs> with all car. of the power of dracula you mean to tell me that he stooped as low as just to throw a stick of dynamite at a kid's <laughs> treehouse <laughs> <laughs> this is the lord of night i mean as close to satan as you could possibly get and he just no no bats dynamite. no also, he can, yeah, he can fly around, but he takes his hearse, like, everywhere yeah. he needs to go. I mean, it's I just, guess he can't like, carry dynamite, that, to be fair. He, he's approaching this with the same level of intellect and weaponry as Wiley e. Coyote. <laughs> Acme box. Probably gets the, the TNT dynamite. from the same store. I mean, how great would it have been, though, if he just shows up with a stick of dynamite, and then when the cops both show up outside, he just pulls a gun. <laughs> he just starts opening fire, and they're like, wait, what? They fire back. Like two-handed opening back. fire. I'm already thinking of a head cannon where him and the Wiley Coyote are having like a feud with each other. So they keep bumping into each other at the Acme store. Like you catch that Roadrunner yet, knowing that he didn't. And then the Coyote pulling up the sign and it says, "You catch them kids yet?" 
And they just kind of give each other a dirty <laughs> look, pick up the dynamite, and leave. <laughs> and Dracula murders uh, Dad's partner. Cold blood. Yeah, yeah, that was rough, especially because I liked the partner in this movie. So yeah, he ends up kind of approaching the house, and then Dell ends up pulling his gun on him. He throws the stick of dynamite underneath the squad car, and it blows up the partner. At which point, Dell naturally uh, starts taking a couple shots at Dracula to find that they do absolutely nothing. The bullets, they do nothing. The way the mom came out of the house there, like, right after he fires the bullets, like, you see the bullet holes in the house, and I just expected her to be, like, shot. <laughs> like, I forgot, like, did he accidentally shoot her? Or, like, before well, she walks out Also, unharmed. I like how she comes out rather, like, not, like, nonchalant. Like, she's interested in what's going on, but not like she's worried. She just kind of comes out like, hey, what's, go- what's going on? It's like, there was an explosion 30 <laughs> seconds ago. Yeah, fifteen. She must have been in the bathroom because uh, <laughs> I feel like that would you would have come out seconds after you heard the explosion. Yeah. Also, the fact that it probably would have blown all the windows out at their house. I'm assuming. Yeah, that's not exactly <laughs> a little firecracker that happened directly behind. Yeah, three sticks of dynamite. Yeah, or I, just one, I guess. But still, <laughs> what if he miscalculated threw the dynamite under the car and then the explosion took him out too? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, shit. He just has a smirk as he's just enveloped in flames, blows the house up. <laughs> <laughs> they finish the ritual. They're done. It's like seven hours later. Dracula's just like limping. Yeah, so they blow the, the squad car up. He takes shots on it. Dracula kind of flexes on him and then turns into a bat and leaves. So that happens. The wife, none the wiser as to what just occurred. And then Dell ends up finding the walkie-talkie to find out where Sean is. And then he ends up heading out to the town center to try to help out with whatever this is going on here. So this is where we get to the town center we talked about. They pull up to the church, quote unquote. And just an interesting fact about this back lot in that that town, that side of the building is a church face. I think if you go around to the right or to the other side, it's like a school building. It's like the front of a high school. Oh, so it's like it's two sides just depending on which different. Yeah, depending on which side you shoot it from, it's a different building. Huh. Fun fact. Movie lot. Movie magic. So yeah, so they find out that the church is closed, at which point they decide they have to do the ritual out in the street because they can't do it at Burger King. Who says you can't, though? You just need a virgin. (laughs) True. I mean, just because you have to do this doesn't mean you have to do it hungry. (laughs) I mean, if I have to do this ritual, I'll do it sitting at a Burger King in 1987. Did it specify (laughs) also that it needed to be a female version? No. So all of it. All of them kids case, had sex then. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking too deep into it. We need a virgin. What about you? Oh, me? No, I fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Fat kid, what about you? I fuck on the first date. <laughs> so. Yeah, I wondered that too. But yeah. So yeah, I never thought about that until you mentioned it. <laughs> then it's like, wait, why don't any of you? Yeah, I, I didn't. That that was a question that was screamed at the TV about two hours ago, or um, <laughs> several hours ago. I know that uh, smoking isn't cool and everything, but damn, if it doesn't, when Rudy lights, you know, he has a cigarette in his mouth and he's standing there waiting for the vampire ladies to come at him. He's got his hand on the stake. He just looks pretty cool with a cigarette in his mouth. He has my favorite line in the movie when so they're doing the ritual and then the three vampire brides are coming across the street and Rudy immediately just like grabs the bow and grabs his arrows and he walks past to go after them. Where you going Rudy? I'm in the goddamn club aren't I? Yeah. Yeah that's like, a great yeah, line. Yeah Rudy lights up his cigarette and then this proceeds just... to get within melee range while holding a bow. That's when I had Steve Harrington flashbacks. Yeah, <laughs> I think they just built this movie. They're like, we have all these cool ass moments and lines for the kid. Now let's make the story around these sweet moments. Yeah, I don't like. I know he did end up killing all of the brides. I don't know why he takes that and then proceeds to keep walking towards them. Like you, you have a ranged weapon. Use a ranged <laughs> weapon. Take a step back. Yeah, and then like he f- like kills the first one and then the second one like gets up to him and then he's like fighting them off and then get stabs it with the um like the bow stake or whatever the arrow stake and then it's like you you can continue backing like kite them like have them chase you keep backing up well it's some realism i don't expect him to be legless in the, all this 
So I'm kind of glad he wasn't also, able to do like three hard shots from 50 yards with a bow and arrow that he never uses. So I, I appreciated that at least. With essentially a, uh, a clothes, uh, a dowel yeah. rod. <laughs> a closet rod. Okay, fine. He's not an archer. <laughs> he should have specced better. So, yeah, Rudy gets the cool scene of him fighting the, the three brides. Meanwhile, we see the bat. Dracula showing up and coming after them, at which point we see the car come driving past and Dell leans out the window and fires shots at Dracula and having him kind of like blow off into a, a building of some sort. And then yeah, everybody he crash chases. Lands. Yeah. So we end up getting this kind of like, well, first of all, so Dell reaches into the car and pulls out more dynamite and then follows <laughs> into the building. <laughs> Where are they getting all of this? He's t- he must have taken that from the hearse at that point then, right? Oh, just... I guess, yeah, because he did leave the car there and take off. Because <laughs> yeah, I'm just wondering, it's like, how does everybody just have dynamite on them? Why is this just commonly sold? So, <laughs> this is like an old Local mine went out of business. Yeah, you know, right yeah. on a sale. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> so he runs up and follows after um, Dracula to go in for the kill, and he ends up finding him like mid transformation in this kind of like weird naked winged humanoid bat form, all covered in like fur. Don't I was look a little surprised me. too that he was able to take injury while in bat form because it did look like he got shot. I yeah yeah, it's funny that it that just that it carried over at all. Like you think like just turn back into a human and I'm fine. Yeah, I don't know what the the healing properties are in terms of how quickly that would come back. Or I don't know if it might just be an in-universe thing here of, yeah, he just recovers slowly. <laughs> he goes up there and he's just dead. It's just, oh. <laughs> Damn wooden bullets. <laughs> they go back to the flashback of Rudy carving wooden bullets in uh, shop class. So, yeah, we have a, a naked half-transformed Dracula just like, dying there and trying to transform back and i like how they do the the shot of as dell is lighting the or getting ready to light the dynamite you see over his shoulder the wolfman coming into the room and then comes up to attack him so now gives gives him a sweet like uppercut punch too <laughs> like it's like almost a cartoonish how he winds up and like swings his arm at him like scorpion and mk2 <laughs> The werewolf walks in and he just like crouches and Dell's like, what? And then he just whoosh. <laughs> <laughs> just spams uppercut. Um, Horse comes in and kicks him like a rock'em up. sock'em robot. <laughs> werewolf fucks up Dell pretty pretty good here. Yeah. Throws him around the room into the Adidas boxes. And then I like how Sean shows up with a baseball bat and then like ta- taps him on the like shoulder or whatever it is or like shouts to him. And when Wolfman turns around, he's like, you looked, and then hits him with a bat. <laughs> hey, asshole. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then Dell, because I think it was Dell who then grabs the dynamite, sticks it in the Wolfman's pants, and they push yeah. him out the window. Which, again, what if they miscalculated the fuse on that? They go to push him out the window, and he just detonates. <laughs> they're down on the ground level, and they're doing the ritual. They look up, and they just see all the windows blow out of that building. <laughs> <laughs> that This explosion was really cool like yeah it looked awesome and it was like i was surprised at how just visceral and like brutal it is just like boom he just in pieces well plus then they they this goes back to their conversation before of like oh how do you kill a werewolf only the silver bullet can kill them because in this case it blows the, the werewolf into pieces and then all the pieces slowly start to like pull back together um, yeah. before the wolf man like the they t-1000 do the, yeah and then the wolf man they do the scene of him like doing the howl and coming back <laughs> which i know i guess the the actual effects for this is they had like all the pieces were like rc cars so they had all of those like the the wheels and whatnot underneath them so the hand and whatnot they were all able to just control to have them zip along and go back to where Hmm. they needed to um which was kind of cool i thought they just like pulled them from off screen like with a Fishing line or something. Yeah, they use strong magnets, and then they held on to it, and then they're like, okay, and shoot, and then they just all let go, and they just zipped back to the body. <laughs> you know it would be funny if he comes back together, and then when you see him later, like, his leg is where his arm should be, like, he's not. 
<laughs> doesn't go back correctly. He looks like, uh, oh, what was that one Frankenstein looking guy from Small Soldiers for the Gorgonites? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> He comes crawling out of the alley and he <laughs> walks up to Rhodey and grabs his pant like, kill me. <laughs> yeah. Does anyone have a silver bullet? <laughs> he walks over, pulls the gun out of Rudy's uh, <laughs> pants, <laughs> loads it himself. There's always these al- ominous shots of a werewolf behind the character. Like We cut and like the police are arriving and the wolfman's running right at Rudy in the street. Yeah. But he doesn't see him. Which it's like I really do like all of those shots in the movie. It just yeah. It, I think it's like I wouldn't say it's a masterpiece of cinematography, but it's like it's shot very competently and composed and very well and stuff. Yeah. Again, they're using anamorphic lenses and it looks fucking awesome. So yeah, we have the the wolf band coming back together. The sister in the meantime completes the ritual and nothing happens. To which Patrick is like, "You're not a virgin, are you?" No? No, what do you mean, no? Well, Steve, but he doesn't count! Doesn't count! (laughs) So, they have to find another virgin. Which is when they suggest, like, they point to Phoebe, and they're like, is she a virgin? (laughs) And they go with that. Do you guys know what virgins are? I I, I really don't think they do. (laughs) Is she a virgin? (laughs) Am I a virgin? (laughs) And that insult to injury, even... Scary German guy's like, yes, she will do. And it takes him a second, and he had to think about it. He's like, no, no, yeah, you're right. And then he thinks, and he's like, wait, I'm a virgin. (laughs) I'll do the ritual. I've never felt the touch of another. Let's send him to hell. (laughs) Yeah, so we end up having Phoebe start the ritual with him, which they're like, she can't read. And he's like, fine, I'll help her. So Rudy is dealing with the all of this. In the meantime, the cops show up and just get destroyed by the Wolfman. Um, (laughs) Like, this entire movie does nothing to show the the competency of this town's police force. It's just keystone cops out here. They show up with their guns, immediately decide to rush into melee range on every monster they encounter, and then just get manhandled. The cops are getting destroyed by the Wolfman. Rudy loads a revolver with the silver bullet, and then he gets his one-liner is bang. Or killing him, which at this point now, Rudy has killed 100% of the enemies they've encountered. He's killed the Wolfman, he's killed the Three Brides, and he's killed the Mummy. So, pretty good track record on Rudy. Which, and then Rudy gets to do his line of like, I told you only one way to kill a werewolf, which, glad despite everything else going on, you still have a chance to remain smug. Thank you. <laughs> oh yeah, so then the Wolfman transforms back and thanks him. That's always sad to me to releasing see. him from his torment. It's very much a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde kind of thing. Now, here's the question. Vampire, you have to stake through the heart. For the Wolfman, it's just they just have to get shot with silver or like killed with silver. I'm assuming it's just like silver is treated as a poison to them, and once it enters the bloodstream, it circulates and they die. Well, if he just steps on like a, a splinter, like a sliver of of Silver, like he's done. For modern, <laughs> modern vampires stem from Dracula, and all of his weaknesses are from that. So I'd Im- I'd imagine modern werewolves stem from the Wolfman. So whatever killed the Wolfman in that movie, I'm sure applies to what it is now. Because ancient folklore is different than what Hollywood made, and after Dracula, the whole. Like, vampires aren't really weak in sunlight. Even in the original Dracula, just he, his powers were, uh, like, sedated during the day. He wasn't, ah, you know, sunlight and he burns to ash. He was just, he was more of a normal dude. But come nightfall, that's when he was a lot more powerful. And I don't know what the... I was never a werewolf person, so I don't know their lore that well. So whatever the wolfman says, I think, is the rule of thumb to kill them. Yeah. Because I'm assuming it's just like the the silver itself is treated as a poisonous substance. Because I think in the original Lon Chaney Jr. Wolfman, I, th- I think he gets like beat to death with the silver wolf's cane or something. So it's not like he has to get shot. It's just like, no, just silver itself uh, <laughs> deals damage. It bypasses resistance. So it would have been great if Rudy just literally shoots him anywhere. A werewolf comes up, he just like shoots him in the foot. Just, uh, thank you. <laughs> 
<laughs> groin. It's like Robocop. Groin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's Robocop. What? <laughs> he transforms back and he's just, really? <laughs> and then just dies. I was going to say he gets shot in the foot and the werewolf just bites his leg off. Like, uh-huh. Just tourniquet. <laughs> Still coming at you. Well, it's because after he reformed, the leg is now on his shoulder, so (laughs) he's still walking after him. (laughs) So yeah, so we end up getting Rudy now killing the Wolfman, at which point, on cue, the Gillman pops out of the sewer and continues just shellacking cops. Um, It's funny, when they cut cut back to the Gillman, and he's just kind of like, he's got his like, hand covering the cop's face almost just like he just stood there suffocating because <laughs> he's just holding him by the head with his hand over his face and then the cop just like becomes limp and like you see the subtitles <laughs> the gill man's like i want to see the light go out of their eyes <laughs> unless he's like planting eggs in the cop's head or oh, something God. <laughs> all of them just like explode <laughs> turn into more gill <laughs> dracula shows back up oh what the, what the hell Goddamn drowners. Put him in the vortex. So, yeah, so the gill man shows up. Horace takes the shotgun from one of the corpses and retreats to try to get into the corner store that uh, EJ and the other bully Derek are barricaded in, at which point they don't let him in. Great. So effectively, they're letting him die. But instead, he ends up shotgunning the gill man, and then EJ finally decides to come out, and he's like, Hey, fat kid. Good job. My name is horrid. Which I think it auto chambers, so not necessary. Probably just wasted a shell, um, I'm assuming. That, that loads but, one into the... So unless he pumped it after shooting the gill man, it would have still had the empty shell in it, in the chamber. Oh, okay. Yeah, but it's I'm a lot of times shotguns so. are pumped unceremoniously for effect, and it doesn't really... It's not really necessary. But in this case, it actually would be. But I don't know who else he's going to be shooting with that gun either. So you you might be right. Uh, DJ and Derek. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, we get the My Name is Horace. Um, he doesn't decide to uh, groin kick his two bullies so their heads explode. <laughs> and then all of these dead cops and the new squad cars pull up and they still insist on running out of their vehicle. Some of them guns in hand and running right up to Dracula to try to take a swing on him. And they're just getting, like, their necks broken or just getting thrown around uh, the the streets from here. So... I guess, guess to be fair, he just looks like a normal dude in the costume. So they might not realize at that point if they're new. But also, if I got a call that it's like, hey, backup needed, (laughs) and I pull up, and I see, like, 15 of my coworkers dead on the ground, (laughs) and this guy is just, like, walking around, I wouldn't be like, you know what? (laughs) I could take him. Get out the baton. Also, they probably would have been on the call, been like, do not approach the monster. <laughs> fucking Dracula. <laughs> they are killing us. Yeah. This this little scene reminds me of the movie Airplane when Robert Stack is walking through the airport and like all these like the Hare Krishnas are coming up to him and he's just <laughs> he's just punching everybody that gets in his way. <laughs> Uh, that reminds me of this right now. Dracula's just decimating every cop that comes up. He does break somebody's neck, too. Yeah. yeah. A lot of death. The sister is almost done with the ritual. And scary German guy uh, decides to try to hold Dracula back so they can finish this. And he gets kind of magic powered to the ground. And then Dracula goes like full Freddy Krueger because he lifts Phoebe. And then he shouts at her. Give me the amulet, you that's a great which like it's like funny but awesome at the same time because it's like okay so at this point he has just had it with everything (laughs) but it it is a cool kind of reveal in terms of the fang and eyes and whatnot when he does kind of like he bears his fangs in front of phoebe after he does the line which i believe supposedly they didn't have her see his makeup originally. Yeah, uh, that's that was in the documentary. He he had to make. I guess they shot the part of the scene where he looks normal, and then he comes up to her for the next take, and his eyes are closed and his mouth is closed, and then reveals it. Yeah. So this way we can get the kind of an actual reaction. They say in the documentary that that's the second take because in the first take she was actually scared shitless, and her scream was just like. 
like she lost her voice kind of scream like, like she like <laughs> she's, she's, <laughs> and then like they're like no we need it to be longer <laughs> like she was actually terrified <laughs> she just instantly passes out just goes limp <laughs> oh, oh wait <laughs> amulet falls hits the ground so yeah like it's a it's a cool kind of a reveal from there and we get kind of that fun reaction before he gets just straight manhandled by frankenstein's monster <laughs> yeah um which I always loved the bogus <laughs> and then just getting like <laughs> thrown through the air and impaled on a fence post. Bogus. I like Dracula's face here. He's just kind of like, who is this motherfucker <laughs> like touching me? <laughs> what if that was his exact line? <laughs> he just like, does like you a serious? slow head turn around to see like who's this <laughs> oh and i'm airborne um <laughs> so yeah so the the portal is now open the vortex has been initiated please keep your hands and feet away so drac grabs sean to try to pull him in too um at which point sean stakes dracula before van helsen pops out to wrestle him into the void and throw a no, thumbs that, up that i laughed at that <laughs> <laughs> I forgot that happened, and I just, I laughed because I it was unexpected. Which, uh, on one hand, I was like, how does he know to throw a thumbs up? And that, then that made yeah, me... that was part of it. Then it made me think, like, <laughs> okay, maybe the void is not just, like, nothingness. Maybe it's, like, all different things from all different times just end up there, and it's just, like, limbo kind of deal. Yeah, he might have, maybe he has, like, television, and he's watching uh, yeah or sitcoms maybe it's like a infinite crisis situation where he's just like sitting out in space and he's able to watch everything that's happening and not interact i don't know well yeah. even um, even maybe. um dracula was pretty savvy through the entire movie he has the ability True. to shape shift into a bat but he's driving a hearse that he managed to find yeah he got his license at some point i mean then again dracula lived through the ages Van Helsing has been stuck inside this. So it's like, at least Dracula yeah. makes a little sense that it's like, yeah, as time goes on and new technology, so he doesn't seem like some weirdo. He probably has been acclimating to everything over the ages. But his wardrobe never changed. Oh, no. <laughs> Styles forever. The, the shot of Sean, like, throwing the enthusiastic thumbs up back at Van Helsing is, like, just a great shot. Yeah. <laughs> so... <laughs> I just love the the thumbs up Van Helsing throws out, um, <laughs> yeah. and then they kind of both wrestle off into the the void from there. And then, unfortunately, our dear friend Frankenstein's monster gets pulled into the void, which Phoebe throws her pet or her, her pet dog, her um, stuffed dog scraps to Frankenstein. And this was kind of really rough as a kid <laughs> of Frankenstein doing the Phoebe goodbye. As he's like holding the stuffed dog getting sucked into the yeah. vortex. It's sad. Go away! Phoebe! Phoebe! No, don't go! Go! Yeah. So, still effective. It's rough. But the portal closes and everybody has a lot of explaining to do for themselves and others. Because now <laughs> the military show up with tanks. A day late and a dollar short. Uh, Rudy casually tosses an arm over the sister, who then rolls her eyes because um, three hours ago he was blackmailing her with nude photos. And then, was this like a free weekend for the military that they just had nothing going on? I think so. They're, they're <laughs> just like crayon thing. Yeah, let's follow up on this. I think they were late because they had to cross reference every Eugene in the area. <laughs> There was no address. I mean, like, 1987, were we between wars? Like, did they just have a lot of time on their hands? Well, it's impressive the letter even got to the military, considering that he just kind of wrote it. And you don't see him put it yeah. in an envelope. Well, no, you did. But you didn't see him fill out the envelope. So, for all I know, he just... Did he have the correct postage? Did he just throw it in a local mailbox and the military, and it's spelled completely wrong? <laughs> or what if that's the only part he did really well at so it's like a crayon letter and then on the front it's completely legible and it's like <laughs> u.s department of uh military affairs eugene has connections with top men so <laughs> then the military just opened fire i can't be too sure here folks <laughs> fact that the leader the cot the captain just shows up and is like all right where are the monsters <laughs> 
Which I guess, like, kudos to them then in this universe. If the military gets a letter like that, they're like, we got to save these kids. This wouldn't be the first time. <laughs> yeah, like, give me a spinoff of, like, what has this military unit been through that are just, like, monsters again? Let's do this. Special ops. <laughs> we were involved in Project Metal Beast. Look up Project Metal Beast. It's a movie. So we end up oh, getting the, the outro with a Monster Squad rap. <laughs> Unrelenting rap. Unrelenting. What movie didn't have one of these types of like talk raps at the end during the late 80s, early 90s? <laughs> I'm a talk rapper. I mean, that's really what it is. It's I I love like hip hop from around this time and whatnot, but like this specifically is like the and then they went to the place that day and then they fought the monsters away. <laughs> and it's like no, hey, that's a great rap. It, man. So everyone is cool. High five your friends. <laughs> so treat your parents right and do your homework. Yeah, it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're exactly right. I mean it's no T U R T L E power. So a little more pizzazz. What'd you guys think? Was this the first time for any of you? No, I watched it at your house. <laughs> I forget. I make everybody watch Monster Squad. Yeah, you uh I know, but before that I've seen it as a kid just several times. You so. uh Showed it to me the first time here. We all sat in the living room and watched it. I think you were disinterested then, too. Yeah, I was a little more disinterested now, to be honest. This is definitely a childhood movie for me. So, I mean, I between when we watched it at your house and seeing it as a kid, you know, there was all those years in between. I was uncomfortable. I dig it. Through a couple of moments, and it just made it... Every time I felt uncomfortable, it was awkward until the next scene that made me uncomfortable, and it made it worse. I think if I watched the made-for-TV version, it might have been a lot more palatable. I'll find the VHS. No, I'm good. <laughs> Damage is done. I don't know. I dig it. There's it, just a lot it, of, like, just, like, iconic moment after iconic I, I moment. I feel it's it's one of those, um, we have this uh, debate amongst ourselves a lot. I grew up watching The Goonies, and that is so similar in a lot of areas where I feel... I like that one better, and then watching this, it just feels like it attempts to try to do the same in a different way, and I just didn't like how it turned out. Because I know it's you like don't. You have the same game released twice with just like different IPs. Yeah, because I know you don't care for the Goonies that much, right? Yeah, like it, it's it's a good movie. It's not anything that I consider a staple of my childhood. Yeah, and that's where I think my affiliation goes with it. Because I just I don't know. And you know, I'm raunchy and inappropriate as. And I try to keep it curb and tamed a lot of the times, but the humor in this is really offensive, more so than I usually would uh, care to admit. Brushing it off as, oh, it's the 80s, there were a couple of moments where like my jaw dropped and I just couldn't believe it. And it just didn't seem right, because it would make more sense if this was coming from a Stephen King novel turned into a movie, but it wasn't. I bridged the gap. I like the Goonies. I like Monster Squad. <laughs> Both childhood classics. So, for anybody out there that either grew up on Monster Squad, hasn't seen Monster Squad, um, I think it's definitely worth a a first look um, if you haven't, or at least taking a, a revisit to it from there. As Nick said, like certainly certain things have not aged well um, in it overall, but I think the the general movie itself is still kind of fun bones to it and. Still a lot of iconic things from this film. But as we said at the the top of the show, because it's now the spooky season, we have some things kind of planned for Halloween. We have some fun things shaping up for the, the season overall. So like, let us know what your favorite Halloween traditions are, what your favorite Halloween movies are, anything that you might have in terms of kind of your own memories of like Monster Squad or just anything else. Um, I know one of the things that I always like to talk about is all of the different like made for tv movies or the halloween cartoons that used to play on all the stations leading up to halloween so uh feel free to reach out to us on twitter facebook instagram at screen refresh or email us your own movie memories at screen refresh at gmail.com so thanks again for coming along for the ride on the monster squad as always i'm tim for nick and dean have a good october and catch us on rule of thirds the third monday of the month did you turn into a bat? It's a callback to when you said it makes a slide whistle noise. <laughs>
<laughs> I forgot about that. I don't. Whoop. I would like an Arnold Palmer at the omelet parlor. <laughs>